Well, it is Five Live Sport, and as you might just have spotted throughout today, uh, we've been celebrating our 30th birthday today here on Five Live. And between now and 10, we've got a really special programme for you. We asked you to choose the defining sporting moments of the past three decades. And over the next two and a half hours, we'll reveal the results and relive some iconic events. All right, engineers, boost up that sound. Listen to this. I don't care what you're doing, stop it. If you're not standing, get up on your feet. The season comes down to these moments now, and in goes Aguero. Oh, Aguero has scored. One nation, one country, one South Africa, and one new World Cup champion. It's going to be a glorious end to a magnificent summer of sport for David Weir. Championship points for the world number one and defending champion Serena Williams. Kelly Holmes will not be denied. This is magnificent! The flash bombs go off like fireworks on centre court. The Times say Lewis Hamilton is the winner. Stop there! Has won the European Cup! Tiger Woods is Masters champion 1997. He could become the best there's ever been. Rachel Blackmore becomes the first female rider to win at the Grand National. This will go down as one of the epic days in Ryder Cup history. Walk on, walk with hope in your heart. It seems ludicrous to say it. Six four, seven five. But a British Six, man has just won Wimbledon. Leicester City are the Premier League champions. Surely Chloe Kelly could have won it an extra time for England. I don't think you'll hear a word I'm saying because you'll realise that Fukuyama, Crest and Frank in story have the lead. She is there! for World Cup glory! Yeah! It's, it's over! Yeah! He's done it! England win the World Cup! It's six! It's six! Wiggins wins the stage! And he looks up at the lights above the ring and that is the end of an era. Arsenal, the champions, unbeaten from start to finish. So a stadium roars and a nation roars as Ennis goes on to win Olympic gold! Well, I've got to say that the hairs on the back of my Ooh. neck are standing up. I've got tingles down my spine. I've got tears in my eyes. I don't know how I'm going to get through the next two and a half hours. But fortunately, I have two people alongside me who are no strangers to Five Live and big sporting events. Our football correspondent, John Murray, and our boxing expert, kind of expert on everything, really, Steve Bunce. I have to say, when I was thinking about this and just listening to that now, I thought, isn't sport on the radio fantastic? I mean, John, what do you think listening to that? For anyone who has invested in BBC Radio 5 Live over the course of the last 30 years, even if it's the full 30 years, a fraction of the 30 years, we, we even though we say it ourselves, we've got an absolute treat in store for, <laughs> for people who love sport on the radio, radio over the course of the next two and a half hours. Mm. And listening to those clips, Ellie, I'm not sure how many there were. I was trying to remember where I was when various ones came up. You're right. I mean, um, you talk about you nearly had tears in your eyes. Well, I went one better. I think I've had to dab my glasses about three <laughs> times. And that's just the opener. That's just the opening two minutes. So so many incredible voices. So many incredible sports people. So much has changed, really, but in, in other ways hasn't changed in the way we cover sport, in the way that we report on these these mm. champions. John, it's, it, you know, it's, it's incredible to think that all of those moments happened in the last 30 years and you think and that and that and that you know it's it's been an incredible era for us yeah i mean i remember back to as you both do as well when bbc radio 5 live was in the offing to replace the old radio 5 what the intention was was to make it a news and sports station mm. and on the sporting side it was live sport that was the 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 central pillar and that remains the case to this day. You know, we, we talk about it, don't we, in the radio sports room about how live sport is the king. That, that, is, that, that is what drives the network. And, and the voices who've done it, I remember very well when I first started working in the sports room, I'd have my head down with my razor blade cutting tapes and, and I would hear voices walking in 
that I'd, I'd never met them. I didn't know their faces. And I turned around, oh my goodness, that's what Peter Bromley looks like. <laughs> and you are now one of those voices, well, John, for the gen- generation to come. Let's, yeah. let's try and not make each other feel really old because we've been there all, <laughs> you've, almost since the start. I've been there since the start. But see, for you as well, I mean, it is, it is the voices, isn't it? It is the moments. It's the people who can deliver those moments so brilliantly. It's different voices over not just the 30 years of Five Live because those commentaries are timeless. Those commentaries there are timeless. If, if I didn't know most of those events, they could have been 1957, they could have been 1967, 1977, 1987. And you invest something, whether it's just John Rawling doing 9.87 seconds of an Olympic 100 metres final, or whether it's the last words after seven weeks of the Rugby World Cup, the last seconds from Robbo, those last seconds, you've invested the time either that day or in the previous six weeks. Or maybe you've only been on for five minutes maybe you've just tuned in for that hundred meters it makes no difference those seconds those last words those final words they live forever they live large in your head well be prepared to get lots of tingles over the next two and a half (laughs) hours because we have got a treat in store for you we're going to look back then at the 30 defining moments of the last 30 years between now and 10 o'clock this is how it worked The top 30 were picked by a well-informed production panel of our top-notch producers. And then from that 30, a top 10 were selected by a Five Live panel of also top-notch and well-informed broadcasters, including John and myself, which then went to a public vote on the BBC Sport website. So we will also be revealing what you voted for as the greatest moment. Now, you might not agree with everything. Your favourite might have missed out, but just enjoy taking a step back in time to relive some brilliant commentary of some truly great sporting achievements. We're going to start our top 10 with this because there are three Olympic moments in the top 10 and our first is at number 10. Great Britain, of course, has a fine tradition in middle distance running and at the 2004 Olympic Games, Kelly Holmes reigned supreme in Athens. Holmes is up to fourth. It's Miles Clark with 200 metres to go from Andrea Nova and here comes Holmes. She's side by side with Matola, but Matola shows her strength and almost elbows Holmes out of the way. Holmes having to come very wide indeed, but she still looks relaxed. She's full of running. This could be a British gold. They come around now towards the straight. And Holmes is challenging. And she hits the front. Matola goes with her. Matola's so strong. Holmes is sprinting for the right line. The two are side by side. Is Holmes going to be the stronger? I think she is. Here comes Chaplak. But Holmes has taken the gold. It is a gold medal for Kelly Holmes for Great Britain. 156.39. And she stares upwards. She doesn't know quite if she's done it. But now she celebrates because confirmation comes and Kelly Holmes, at the age of 34, is the Olympic champion. They're coming up now, 250 metres to go, and Holmes tries to go past Abligesi. She does so. She's up into fifth place, and around they go now, around the final bend. It's still Yevdokimova from Hoyetska, and Holmes is coming to challenge. She comes onto the shoulder of Tomashova. She's up into second place. She looks to see if there's any danger behind her, and there isn't. It's now down to the sprint. It's Yevdokimova from Holmes, and now it's starting to hurt, and Tomashova's not beaten yet, but Holmes hits the front. Tomashova tries to go with but Kelly Holmes will not be denied. This is magnificent. A brilliant run from Kelly Holmes and she takes the gold in the best time she's ever produced and what a moment to do it. Kelly Holmes, 800 metre champion, is now the 1500 metre champion and that was just magnificent. John, we've read on our biogs week after week when we followed Kelly, Britain's greatest ever middle distance runner. My, she is male or female for me, the best middle distance runner. In my era, I have just been so privileged to see the most phenomenal double by the nicest athlete you would ever meet, and my, does she deserve it. Well, Alison Kerbishley alongside John Rawling on commentary for Kelly Holmes winning the 800 and 1500 metre double. Mm. And Steve Bunce, you were in that stadium in Athens, weren't you, for the 800 metres. How close was that race? Well, first start, I mean, I don't want to, to drag on here, but she shouldn't have even been in the race. She wasn't meant to run the, 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 the 800. She decides to run the 800 very late in the day. There's all sorts of rumours, whether it was six days, five days, or the day before qualification 
segregation. And the problem was, one of the problems was Mutola there. And you heard John there just trying to stay calm. John Rawlin commentated. Mutola was coached by the same woman as Kelly Holmes. So there was a problem there. She had to reach out to people. Plus, the 1500 was her race that was mm. coming up, I think, five or six days later. So she was drawn. Plus, she, she was full of injuries. And I don't want to sound like an old broken record. She was full of injuries. She was talking about retirement. She had no chance. Come on, let, let, let's be absolutely honest here. And you could hear Kerbishly there. She was nearly in tears. I think, I'm told a second after that, she was in tears. It was one of the most improbable doubles and done in style. And the 1500 on the Saturday, one of the great Saturday Olympic nights of all time, that was just, I mean, I was floating on air watching that one. Yeah, I mean, to, to get that double as well, it's so difficult to do. You know, to be able to, to go through the rounds, you know, to be fit enough, to be in the, a position where you can run all the heats, you can run the semi-final, you can get to the, the start line in the final and run that as well. Well, you, you, they've been at this brilliant place in Cyprus with a beautiful name like Achilles Achilles Mountain or something. It was just beautiful. That was that was and and in at that camp there, she talked about how she'd never felt so good. But that was for the fifteen hundred. So she'd have a heat, she'd have a semi final, then she'd have a final. And so what she had to do after the eight hundred, I mean, it makes sense, but you still have to think about it. Is she had to pull back in both of those races, but still qualify. I mean, the the planning, the mental strength, and I think we I think we touched on it. She was thirty four. Mm. She yeah. was a seasoned army campaigner and I'm convinced that's what got her through mm. it. And the well, other thing about that is that at 34, everyone knew her. She wasn't new on the scene and anyone who took an interest in athletics knew the backstory and that, I think, is what added to it. Yeah, and, and the, fact, the fact that you had Alison reacting in the way that she did cheer. We're going to hear lots of people cheering <laughs> during commentary moments and actually the purists will say to you, summarise it, do not make a noise. But actually there are times when you just get in that moment and particularly with, with athletes and competitors you, you that know are it's known a big one. You know it's a big moment when that happens. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, let us hear from Dame Kelly Ho as she now is, who spoke with us for the show. Well, I think what had happened previous to 2004 was so much of a roller coaster, highs and lows, injuries galore. You know, I had seven years of injuries, yet I'd still managed somehow to have the resilience to keep fighting back for every championship and get a medal. So the whole hope was still there of, you know, achieving a dream that I've wanted for 20 years. But it was then the mental capacity to think, can I still just lift this up? Taking on that double, though, that 800, 1500 metre double was a big risk. I mean, you know, even even though you knew you were in fantastic shape and also because the 1500 came second and that was the event that you dreamt of being Olympic champion in. Yeah, I took the biggest risk, I think, of my whole career because I doubled up, as you know, in many championships. Going into that year in 2004, I won all my 800 meter races and lost pretty much all my 1500 meters. But I think it was a psychological thing because I was so almost desperate to do the 1500 well. Every time I went into a race, I was just messing up. Whereas in the 800, because I hadn't thought, I just was using that almost as the training tool for the 15, I was just able to run it. So there is a thing where your mindset becomes the overarching factor of your success because you can talk yourself out or into something when you're in shape anyway. And so when I went in to do the 800, it's because actually going back to the holding camp, I did this 400 metre session and the 400 metre runners had just done a similar session and I'd beaten the 400 metre runners times in this session. And they were like, you're going to do the four by four as well. I was like, no. <laughs> and um, I just knew like, I was flying, you know, I had a training partner, a male training partner, and that really helped me, with that prep. So when I went in to decide, I literally only decided, I think the day before we went into Athens, and I was like, what have I got to lose? If I come away with two medals of any colour, because I really believed I'd win two medals, what a great end to a career. I knew I was in really great shape, but I just never, ever visualise me winning Olympic gold in 800. I don't know why, because I'd won equal amounts of pretty much of medals. But uh, it was just something, something clicked. And then I won. And it was just like, <laughs> I mean, everyone remembers my face, my eyes popping out my head. It was a shock to me like it was to everyone else. I still look at it. I watched that race a million times because I do it in my speaking engagements. And I still think, how the hell did I win this? <laughs> Well, that was Dame Kelly Holmes. I mean, that's the extraordinary thing, isn't it, Steve, that actually at 34, she was in the best shape she'd ever been. 
Yeah, but she she was also worried. You know, she talks about having the, the two heads. One says, go in, enter the 800, you can win it. And the other one says, don't be stupid, you can't win it. Just before she leaves, the place, by the way, is called Aphrodite Hills in Cyprus. <laughs> now, you know that's lovely. So when, as she's leaving there, she turns to various people and she says, everything's going so well, it's all gone so well. It's bound to go wrong. So she had this belief. And my understanding is, after she won the 800, there seems to have been a weight lifted off her shoulders. And I can un- absolutely understand that. So the weight was lifted off her shoulders. So in a bizarre kind of way, and let's whisper it, she did the 1500 for fun. She got the gold <laughs> and she just enjoyed herself. And that night, that particular Saturday night, uh, that, that's when the 4 by 100 metres boys pulled off their amazing stunt against the Americans. On that particular night, she ran like she never had a care in the mm. world, which was probably not what was going on inside her gut, but she ran like she never had a care in the world. She put fear into the others and you can sense that. You can sense that in any sport. You know when you're watching two athletes, no matter what the sport is, John, you know that, you can sense when a player of some description has put fear into their opponent and she put fear into that field. Well, I was in Athens. I wish I could say that I'd been in the stadium for that night, as you say, for the the men's 4 by 100 later on and Kelly Holmes as well. But being in Athens, I went for a kebab instead. And I've always regretted it, but it was a good kebab. Let's face it. Anyway, <laughs> don't, don't, you know, we all like to think that we, we know lost enough. For words. <laughs> I mean, that, that was kind of the, the options mostly was going for kebabs. But yeah, no, I, 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 we would all like to think, you know, we know, we know when things are going to happen, but it just proves sometimes you just don't. But that was a, such a, a lovely interview that I did with Kelly. She gave us a half an hour of her time. She was really frank and open as well. So you'll be able to hear that whole interview in The Path to Paris, which is our Olympics and Paralympics show on Five Live. Over the coming weeks, it's just 120 days to go until the Paris Games open. We'll be across it all here on Five Live. So let's go to number nine. Your ninth moment is one of the great golfing comebacks. It's the autumn of 2012. And Europe are 10-4 down on day two of the Ryder Cup in Medina. But with the inspirational Ian Poulter in the side, we were about to witness a sporting miracle. Ready to roll it forward towards the hole. It goes. He has it. Of course he does. Of course he does. Ian Poulter wins the match. He has birdied the 14th, the 15th, the 16th, the 17th, and now the 18th, and now an embrace with Rory McIlroy. Yes, the USA is still have a handsome lead, but it's not as much as it could have been. What a victory for McIlroy and Poulter, but what a performance by Ian Poulter towards the end. It's come down to this. Five feet. Martin Keimer. This to retain the Ryder Cup for Europe on the 18th green at Medina. Sends it on its way. And in! And the cup is safely in European hands. And he leaps into the arms of his captain. And he's lifted aloft. Martin Keimer's the hero. And Europe have retained the cup. Somehow Europe have found a way. The comeback to end all comebacks achieved in hostile territory. And somewhere a man called Seve, the golfing patron saint of lost causes, is smiling down the broadest Seve smile you've ever seen. His apprentice Ollie has done it somehow, and he's done it Seve style from the most unlikely of positions. And his hero is Martin Keimer, who's nerve held to hold that five-footer and make sure that the Ryder Cup stays in European hands. So beautiful commentary by our golf correspondent Ian Carter and Andrew Cotter there as well. And John Murray, you were part of that commentary team for the miracle of Medina mm. as it became known. But I mean, it was a miracle, wasn't it? There was no way in the world that they should have won that. I clearly remember exactly where I was and my match had finished um, and we were then deployed as we do on the final day of the Ryder Cup to certain points on the course. And then when it was all coming down to the crunch, we were actually all deployed around the 18th. So I can see myself halfway down the left-hand side of the 18th in a amongst the trees, actually watching Ian commentating on Martin Keimer on the green. And that is what you want the Ryder Cup to be. That's how you want it to finish. And I'm so pleased that, you know, when we were judging this, Ali, you'll remember, I made a strong claim for this because because it's a great event. You know, it's become a great event. And Even for uh, people who aren't don't follow golf for the rest of absolutely, the year. yeah, and and it had kind of come to the fore in the eighties before Radio Five Live came into being, but it's been such an important thread 
of a big sporting event during the course of the 30 years. And whenever it comes around, we clear the schedules. Commentating on the Ryder Cup is is unlike anything else because it doesn't build to a crescendo. It starts at a crescendo. <laughs> the first shot on the first morning is massive. Mm. And it just carries on like that. The thing that struck me about that watching it, and not watching all of it, I was one of those guys that tuned in, tuned in. It was one of those, it was like a slow build. You Mm. ended up watching it. Now, one of the things that that struck me was the story that emerged afterwards that Rory and, and Poulter were convinced going into that last day, yeah. even though it was still 10-6, it had been 10 they were convinced that they could pull off this miracle. Yeah. Did you get that feeling when you're out there? Because I love getting the idea that you, you're in the middle, you're, in, you're having breakfast in the morning, and genuinely were you talking, there's seven commentators sitting around, and, and the engineer's on the other table, and the other people going back, you know, were you genuinely thinking, this could happen? You always do that, and I also remember it at Brookline as well, when it went the other way. Mm. I remember very much at Brookline, sitting in the conference with Ben Crenshaw, who it was the captain at Brookline, and I remember him sitting there saying, I have a feeling. <laughs> and it was a very similar scenario, and I remember us thinking, they're not going to turn this around, and they do turn it around. Yeah. Did, you have, did you have the feeling, Johnny? Are you, <laughs> you, you going to tell now, us here you had the feeling? Because of that, I always have the feeling. <laughs> and, and, you know, I've, I've learned over the years, really, to try not to write anything off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you must feel Follow your gut, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well. yeah. I mean, what a year we had in 2012. What a year of sport. We will be hearing Super Saturday from the London Olympics a little bit later on in the show. But here are a couple of other moments from that year which made our top 30. 250 metres to go, Shang leading now, but being taken on by David Weir. Weir is having to go the longer way round in lane two, but now he's surging, he's driving, he's pushing, and he's into the lead, into the home straight. But now Shang on the inside, stadium and when they come to write the history of this magnificent summer of sports they will reflect on how no one has left a bigger imprint on the Paralympic Games than David Weir. And now further back in the peloton his arms aloft Bradley Wiggins rides into the record books one of the great moments in British sporting history here in Paris in yellow Bradley Wiggins wins the Tour de France well what do you do to top three Olympic gold medals it's quite a tall order isn't it but Bradley Wiggins has somehow found a way he's topped the lot he stands on cycling's Everest he is the winner of the 2012 Tour de France well that was Simon Brotherton and before that Mike Costello and the noise inside that a London stadium of the Olympic Stadium for David Weir um, the Paralympics it's a real kind of game changer I think you think of the way that sport has changed in the 30 years and actually what happened in 2012 changed the way we cover disability sport for good as well but we are going to go back to another Olympics 12 years before that it's our second Olympic moment of the top 10 and it features one of Britain's all-time great Olympians It's so tense, we're so close to history. Great Britain leading. Redgrave in that second seat knows how close he is to five successive gold medals. Here come Italy again, and the Australians aren't out of it. The Australian Slovenia disputing the bronze medal position. Italy trying to get close to Great Britain. Great Britain have maintained that lead. We've only got 200 metres to go. Great Britain lead. Italy second. Great Britain up to 44 strokes a minute. The power is on. They're surging for the line. Are they going to hold off the Italians? Here they are. 15,000 people on their seat. Out of their seats now. Cheering Great Britain on. Great Britain lead. 75 minute, metres to go. Italy come again. Italy haven't finished. Great Britain only a few metres ahead. It's going to be so, so close. Great Britain reaching for the line. Reaching for the line. There's only five metres to go. And Great Britain yes! are Olympic yes! champions. My word, history is made. I don't care what you're doing. Stop it. If you're not standing, get up on your feet. Applaud Tim Foster and James Cracknell. Cheer for Matthew Pinson. 
but take the roof off for the greatest British Olympian of all time, the greatest roar of all time, Steve Redgrave, at 38 years of age, sensationally, five successive Olympic gold medals. Well done, Great Britain. Well, if any crew could have handled the pressure they must have been under for the last two days, it is this crew, if there's any athletes that could have performed when most required, it is these athletes. And they are elated. Matthew Pinson, quite rightly, stands up. He's going to crawl down the boat. He's going to crawl over the head of Tim Foster. He's looking for Steve. He's going to give Steve Redgrave an almighty oh. hug oh. because these guys have proved now for three Olympics that they, they are champions. And Redgrave, Redgrave at last can retire the most brilliant Olympian the yeah. Britain has ever produced. And Pinson, having embraced Steve Redgrave, falls off the boat. He's into the lake. What a scene. What an embrace. And I hope you don't mind, but I'm going to have a weep. Leading up to Sydney, there was a lot of talk about uh, Steve Redgrave had this dream of being uh, a five-time Olympic gold medalist, which was absolutely rubbish. I thought I might be able to get to, to three games and possibly win one gold medal. But I was always very good at, at looking forward and not looking back. So in Sydney, my aim was trying to win a gold medal that I didn't have. Just happened to, to, to make a total of five. So I think that probably helped in some ways. If, if you look back too much, is that uh, the situation is that uh, you then get carried away in, in your own hype in some ways and think it should be a formality when you've got to work even harder year on year to... Uh, uh, just stay at the same level and staying at level is never good enough. You've got to move forward and be better and faster and because there's always people over your shoulder pushing the boundaries a little bit more. And looking at the, the four in Sydney as well, that, that famous four that got you over the line by just a fraction, fraction of a tiny, it, little tiny bit of a canvas of a boat. Did you ever think that actually there was quite a lot of, they had quite a, a, a difficult task because of the pressure, because of knowing that it was going to be your fifth? Yes and no. In, in some ways, that the, the sort of the months lead up to it, that you can get sort of drowned in your own thoughts um, and and the pressure on what you're trying to achieve. And you see it with with the Ryder Cup is is that the bond of the, the, the well certainly on the European side of the Ryder Cup it, is that you're doing something bigger than just one person. And uh, that uh, you don't want to let yourself down, but you don't want to let your team down. Going back to your partnership with with Matthew Pinsent, was that the the most special? Do you think was it the most important partnership of your life, apart from obviously fr from your wife? Um, of, of course, I, I uh, the uh, uh, awards that I've been given by the BBC at uh, the Sports Review. Uh, notably, I've uh, forgotten to mention my wife at each one of them, so uh, I've had a lot of ribbing from that over over the years. Uh, yes and no. It was very special between with, with, with Matt and I uh, of competing at um, uh, three games together. But honestly, it's the first one that's the special one, is that you have this dream to become Olympic champion and uh, that uh, you feel that you can do it. There's people around you feel that you can do it, but you've got to put that sort of dreams into reality. And so crossing that line for the first time of that dream becoming a, a reality is uh, is probably the most special one. It's um, I get asked the question a lot and I try and sort of spin it around in some ways is that I'm a father of three, is that uh, of asking me which is my favourite child. Politically, I'm supposed to say, oh, they're all the same. But as they're growing up, they all have good days and bad days as long as we do as well. And uh, that... Uh, that uh, your feelings change minute by minute, hour to uh, hour to hour, and they've got their own personality. They're all special in their own right. But if my arm was really twisted, it has to be the first one for that reason, because it uh, it is taking that dream into reality. Well, that was Sir Steve Redgrave, who famously said, uh, didn't he, after Atlanta, if you ever see me near a boat again, then shoot me. And then came back and, and won his fifth uh, in Sydney. And that's our number eight in our all-time list, our top 10 moments as voted for by you. Do you think that he's still the greatest British Olympian of all time, Steve? I do. 
I mean, Daley Thompson obviously has a, a big claim. I mean, if Daley was here now, we wouldn't even be talking about Steve Redgrave. We'd have we'd have <laughs> we Daley we'd have Daley in one to ten. It's just straightforward. <laughs> that's just that's the way Daley works. Uh, no, I, I think so because looking at the, 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 what happened in Sydney, knowing that the Italians had stuffed them in Lucerne not that much longer before, and the Italians fancied it, and they were a real arrogant group, the Italians. And I happened to sort of see them. There was a press conference one day, and I went along to it because I'm an Olympic nerd, so I spend 24 hours a day at the Olympics doing stuff. And I remember these Italians, and of course, all rowers are enormous. They're all giants. They're all six foot five, six, seven. They haven't got any fat on them. And these Italians had these big sort of dressing gown style hooded tops on. And I thought they, they thought they were like from a Marvel series. And of course, they were so confident on that lake that day. And they, they it was this mad surge and some sort of technical thing about how many how many pulls they did. It just set all sorts of records. And they held on one by like a foot and a half, 0.38 mm. of a second. It's obscene. Well, we had Alan Green alongside Richard Phelps comment commentating there and and like Alan John football is your main thing but you've done other sports as well and I always remember Greeny saying that he loved doing the rowing it brought him such joy to do it mm. and as, as Steve says that's why these are defining moments aren't they because mm. because they're so close they're me- they're so memorable but I mean that that commentary from Alan I remember it so well because I just think that is the most gripping evocative atmospheric piece of sports commentary, emotional as well, isn't it, from Alan, who I know had very much invested in the rowing and, uh, you know, spent a lot of time working on that. And in terms of, as you say, Ellie, the commentary for Alan, for me, for Simon Brotherton as well, so for most of our time being football commentators, I always remember Simon saying to me what he liked about commentating on cycling was, and same for rowing, there's a finish line. (laughs) It finishes. In football commentary, OK, even even if it is a very late goal, there's almost always still time. You, you might not be calling the winning moment. You might not be. As we might find out as we move through the top ten. As we exactly. may well do, yes. But with the, uh, but with the rowing, so often in my limited time of, of commentating on rowing, what I used to love about it was the ebb and flow. Mm. And there was a lot of ebb mm. and flow. The crews would be ahead drop back so it's it's quite it, it's an exciting watch yeah and, and also you've done you've done taekwondo uh, have you done taekwondo you've no, done judo not taekwondo. you and i sat I've, together I've, in the, the commonwealth games didn't i've we? stood in, in for judo. you doing judo <laughs> which was a challenge fortunately you turned up you'd been sent somewhere else i think so in glasgow this i think wasn't it it was it, it was glasgow. In glasgow. you'd been sent somewhere else i briefly covered judo in beijing yeah. And I'd been a presence, really, just to keep an eye on what happened there. But and, and then sent there. And I was sitting next to Barry McGuigan, who also was not steeped in judo. Uh, and <laughs> you turned I, up. Well, you, were, you then turned up and you were you were like an angel of mercy. Well, I mean, I think, I think it would be a case of the partially sighted leading the blind, probably, <laughs> on that one. Well, look, coming up, we will be counting down from number seven to number four. We'll be reliving some of the biggest boxing moments from the past 30 years. And that's all coming up after the latest news here on Five Live. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. And with the news on 5 Live, I'm Giuliano Casaday. BBC News has seen evidence the post office knew the Horizon IT system could cause accounting errors when it denied such claims in court. A report by the independent auditors Deloitte found that in 2017 the software could cause problems. The post office continued, though, to insist only theft or mistakes were to blame for apparently missing money. Essex Police says officers have arrested a man in his 40s on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter in connection with the death of the TV personality George Gilby. Mr Gilby, who's best known for appearing on Gogglebox, died yesterday after a fall at work. And the founder of the FDX cryptocurrency exchange, Sam Bankman-Fried, has been sentenced to 25 years in jail after he took more than $10 billion from unsuspecting customers. Welcome back to Five Live Sport. We are counting down the 30 most defining sporting moments from the past three decades on Five Live. John Murray and Steve Bunce are with me. And we're going to talk about football for a minute or two because there have been so many incredible football moments on the station. We could probably, John, have done a a top 30 on football alone. Um, But when Five Live came on air in 1994, the very first tournament, the World Cup in America was a pretty low-key affair as far as the home nations are concerned. Well, very much so. And and also with because of the time zone as well, provided a challenge as so many of the World Cup tournaments have. But I think that 
you know, when, when we came to judging the final 10, it was quite a difficult balance, wasn't it? Because not just on Five Live, generally, football dominates, doesn't it? Mm. Because it's such a big beast. It'll eat up everything if you let it. But that had a very different feel to it. And we become so invested, don't we, in the home nations and sometimes, sometimes a little too invested in the home nations. When they're not there, then you can have that more general view. It's a little bit like Wimbledon before Tim Henman, (laughs) I feel. I think there was a more open-minded approach to the tournament and to the sport Mm. than there were when you had some real home contenders. Well, talking about investment in the home nations, two years later, Five Live finally got a big tournament involving home nations. It was Euro 96 on home turf and it was a pretty special few weeks as football very nearly came home. All right, engineers, boost up that sound. Listen to this. Now Gascoigne for England lifts the ball over Hendry in the air. to Anderton. Anderton strike deflected. Van der Sar hasn't got it out. Sheringham's there and it's 4-0 to England. Sheringham's got two. Shearer's got two. Holland are being absolutely destroyed here. Here comes the corner teed in by Gascoigne. Little header and Shearer's there and scores for England. England have scored after only two minutes. A corner kick from Gascoigne was flicked on at the near post and Alan Shearer charged in like a bull and headed the ball past Kopka. It's an absolutely dream start to the semi-final. Gareth Southgate, because it's now 5-5, it goes to the sudden death and Gareth Southgate, who has been magnificent at the heart of England's defence, now has to score a goal to keep England going in the European Championship. Here he comes. Oh, and it's been saved by Kopka. Kopka dives to his right. Gareth Southgate didn't really strike it cleanly. He looks down. He looks forlorn. Kopka moves away, holding his head and hoping that Germany can take advantage. Andy Muller places the ball very carefully in the spot. Seaman has been the hero for England throughout the championship. He has to be again. Muller comes up and it's a goal for Germany. And as in Turin, six years ago, the Germans held their nerve better and Germany are through to their fifth European Championship final. The dream dissolves for England. They dissolve inside the centre circle and it's German celebration. So Euro 96, we heard lots of your predecessor, Mm. Mike Ingham, in that commentary, John. And it's extraordinary, isn't it, to think that um, Gareth Southgate, Mm. that missed penalty, is going to be Mm. managing England in another European Championship finals this summer in in Germany. But I was there as a fan. Actually, I was there in the 94 World Cup as a fan as well, and then as a fan in 96. I've never actually covered a major football tournament for Five Live in the last 30 years. Well, Um, time yet. (laughs) Probably not. Um, but, but how important was Euro 96 for the country, do you think? Yeah, I think uh, listening to that and the me- memories absolutely come flooding back. I remember I was working at Wimbledon that summer and I remember driving to Wimbledon in the mornings, the sun was shining. It's a little bit like Boris Johnson's sunlit uplands, isn't it? To think back to mm. Euro 96 and the feeling that there was around it. And uh, as you say, it feels like it's part of the narrative that we've had over these three decades. Gareth Southgate, the penalty that was saved there, the penalty shootout victory in Moscow, the Euro final under Southgate that goes to penalties and you see Gareth Southgate with Bukayo Saka, who he sent forward to take his first penalty as Southgate was sent forward to take his first penalty in the semi at Euro 96. And then Qatar, how does it end? Because Harry Kane misses a penalty. So... That is an absolute thread, isn't it? Yeah, 
We're not going to talk redemption because it's a, it's, a cheap, it's a cheap way of putting it. But I mean, Buncey, what were you doing back in 1996? What are your memories of that summer? It was obviously it was Atlanta Games. I was at the mm-hmm. I was at the Atlanta Games, and I was just covering as much boxing as I could. I was working for the Daily Telegraph, and I remember being offered some tickets for that semi final. And it was a really complicated process. I had to get somewhere by a certain time to get them and then someone needed paying, but he wasn't being paid there. And in the end, I said no, and I regretted it. It was fairly obvious. It's like me and my kebab in Athens. No, 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 it's not. (laughs) Time out. It's nothing like your kebab in Athens because you had a pass which got you in to that Olympic stadium and you could have got in there somewhere. So it's nothing like your... (laughs) Don't try and palm off your kebab in Athens and and tell me it's the same as me not taking up the offer of two semi-final tickets. I was bad. You were terrible. Sorry, Sorry. Elliot. I love you to death, but you're never, ever going to live down that kebab. I know. Well, look, Euro 96 is not in the top 10. It wasn't our top 30. But we're going to go back to the top 10 and football takes up the number seven spot as we go right back to the new Camp in 1999 for a remarkable Champions League final. Back on spins and back on plays it to his left. Gary Neville's left foot plays it into the penalty here and Effenberg, tired though he is, diverts it behind for a corner. Key for the night now again, delivery by Beckham. Everybody up, absolutely everybody, including Schmeichel. Schmeichel's inside the Munich penalty area. Beckham crosses, stoppage time. Schmeichel jumps, falls to the far post towards York. Half cleared, King shoots, Sheringham equalises! Kenny Sheringham has equalised in stoppage time for Manchester United! Can you believe it? Oh, Teddy Teddy went to Manchester United and he might win the lot yet! Well, you felt it was coming. I mean, they had an earlier chance with Dwight York about a minute earlier. Beckham threw the corner in. Everybody challenged for a second. Bayern had a chance to clear. The ball was returned. And at first, when Sheringham put it in the back of the net, I'm straight away looking at offside. He wasn't offside. What happened was most of the Bayern players had pushed out and Sheringham even didn't make great contact, but he made enough contact. Naturally, programmes will be delayed if we require extra time and remember in extra time a golden goal will finish it and Manchester United have got their legs Alan has the pendulum swung red flares go off at the end to our left we've got about a minute of stoppage time to go it's now Manchester United 1 Bayern Munich 1 Teddy Sheringham's vital contribution as it's laid forward by Irwin and Solskjaer's after it and he's onside and Sheringham makes a run into the penalty area Solskjaer just to the left of the box tries to pull the cross back and hits Kapoor and it's a corner to Manchester United and Schmeichel won't come up for this one <laughs> uh, I think that's a safe bet surely not a winner in stoppage time we've already had an equaliser Beckham crosses from the left right footed it's a clear header and it's lifted into that Solskjaer has won the European Cup for Manchester United. It's absolutely astonishing. It was Sheringham who headed it on. And Solskjaer stabbed the ball with his right foot into the roof of the net. And Manchester United rule Europe. I don't believe it, but it's happened. They've come from 1-0 down in stoppage time to beat Bayern Munich. And the Munich players are on their knees. They don't know what's hit them. Manchester's hit them. What a substitution, Sheringham with the touch from Beckham's corner, Solskjaer as only he can reacted in the middle of the six yard box, look at the Germans, they are lying down, there are seven players in their own penalty area lying down, they cannot believe it, what a fantastic substitution by Manchester United. What about that roar? Well, (laughs) I'll tell you something. I said earlier tonight in the commentary how often questions have been posed about this Manchester United side and they keep on answering them. I can't believe that they're going to win from this position. But they're winning. The ball's on the edge of their penalty area. Is that the final whistle? It is! Manchester United have won the Champions League and Alex Ferguson is embraced by his staff. He's dancing with the light. His players celebrate. And to a man... Munich are on the turf. They can't believe what's happened to them. Peter Schmeichel, embraced by Raymond van der Heij. Well, what scenes of delight and delirium. And Alex Ferguson still hasn't got on the pitch yet. 
He's leaving it to his players. I'm sure he's close to tears. I'm sure the Manchester United manager is close to tears. But he's leaving the stage so far to an incredible bunch of heroes. Can you believe that they've come back from this, Mark Lawrence? I have never known an end to such a football match, such an important football match in my life. It is absolutely incredible. And English football as a whole should celebrate because English football is back on top of Europe. It's 15 years since Liverpool won the European Cup. Manchester United have taken up the gauntlet and they've won a fantastic treble, an unbelievable treble, joining Celtic, joining Ajax. But I tell you, winning the European Cup, the standard the way it is now, is probably the greatest achievement of all. Alan Green and Mark Lawrenson, as heard, unedited yeah. on Five Live. Absolutely remarkable. I mean, John, we should just say, shouldn't we, that that we had a big discussion in our panel to decide the top 10 moments. And we'll come back to some of the other great domestic moments of the last 30 years very shortly. But what was it about that treble in 1999 that really stood out? Yeah. And we should say, you know, remember, this is a piece of fun. People will say, mm. well, why is this in? Why mm. is that not in? Mm. Et cetera, et cetera. But we're talking about defining moments, defining moments that appeared on, on Five Live. And to do that treble, the historic nature of it, the drama of it, brilliant commentary as well. Like Alan's commentary on Steve Redgrave, that commentary, I remember so many people would come to me, and presume it happened to Alan as well, but so many people would talk about those pieces of commentary that just absolutely encapsulated the moment. And to hear Mark Lawrence, and you know, I know Mark so well, I've worked so many events with Mark, for him to say that, that carries real weight to say he'd never seen anything like mm. it. When you listen to it live like that, and unedited like that, you can hear Greeny just running out of energy. He's absolutely exhausted. He can't believe after the Sheringham goal, he's talking now about the golden goal. And he almost doesn't want to believe what he's seeing on the pitch. So he's commentating, but he's in disbelief. And it's when you listen to it raw like that and unedited and uncut and long like that in real time, it's just pure and utter disbelief. Mm. Just th that particular thing. That, that little bit there makes that extraordinary. As an Arsenal fan, I'd like to discuss the rest of the season with you <laughs> on account of Arsenal stuffing them all over the place and losing the championship by just one point. But we'll leave it there because that would be childish. That would be childish. That would be, childish. That would be picky, wouldn't it? I'll leave it there, John. Well, the fact that actually everybody has their team pretty much. Everybody at Five Live. We try not to give it away too much. But everybody listening to Five Live has their team. And that was very specifically about the Manchester United treble. But as John has hinted, there were lots of club moments that made our top 30. Well, could this be Roma revisited? The problem for Liverpool is that the greatest striker in Europe at the moment, Andrei Shevchenko, the European Footballer of the Year, the man whose decisive penalty won the European Cup at Old Trafford against Juventus two years ago. He wants the ball immediately. His body language looks all right. He wants to get on with it. But of course, if he misses here, Liverpool, against all the odds, have won the Champions League. Shevchenko, Dunak saves for Liverpool! And against all the odds, the team who were 3-0 down at half-time, Liverpool have won the Champions League. Walk on, walk on with hope in your heart. This is amazing, a night they will never forget. Liverpool are champions of Europe. We are playing the last two minutes of the Premiership season, which began for Arsenal in this stadium 39 weeks ago with a victory over Everton. Few people could have anticipated what was going to follow. Well, you know, these boys are going to go off and they've got a tough summer coming up. People like Henri and Vieira, Ray are all going to be involved. There it goes, Paul Durkin, one of English football's most distinguished referees, blows his whistle for the last time and confirms something that hasn't happened since the very first season of league football in this country 115 years ago. Arsenal, the champions, unbeaten from start to finish. An absolutely monumental achievement through sunshine, through snow, through wind and rain. 
through summer, autumn, winter and spring. Played 38, lost zero. Will it ever, ever happen again? Willian with a free kick for Chelsea. Oh, he's angled it wide here to the left-hand side. They're not going to take it to the corner flag, are they? They are! And that's it! It's finished 2-2. And we can say now, Leicester City are the Premier League champions. They've won the league for the first time in their history. The impossible dream is now reality. And they have blown apart the established order of the Premier League. Tottenham were the final challengers, and tonight they've been denied by Chelsea here at Stamford Bridge. Leicester City, winners of the Premier League in 2016. I can't believe it. I bet you can't believe it. I suspect they can't believe it. But 2016 in the Premier League, it's the year of the Fox. And Leicester City everywhere, wherever you are, you must be celebrating like you've never celebrated before. The most important moment in Leicester City's 132-year history. Improbably, gloriously, Leicester City are the champions. Morgan is just getting the medal around his neck. Here comes the captain and Steve Worthy, Leicester City fanatic, die-hard. He's going to present the trophy. Listen to the crowd. They're busy revving it up. Here we go. Leicester City. Premier League champion. 2015-16. The most improbable sporting history, sporting story. The biggest story in the history of the Premier League. Manchester United have beaten Sunderland by one goal to nil. The season comes down to these moments now. And in goes Aguero. Oh! Aguero has scored for Manchester City. Sergio Aguero, with seconds to go, has ended 44 years of heartbreak. What a moment for the son-in-law of Diego Maradona. There are people kissing and hugging in front of us. Manchester City lead QPR by three goals to two. And right at the end, the man from Argentina looks like he's done it. Well, absolutely incredible. There was a last-ditch tackle. The ball came in right on the very edge of the box. It broke to Aguero. Hasn't really had a chance all afternoon. Kept his cool, drove the ball in at the near post, and that has sent Manchester City absolutely delirious. The United game is already finished. I'm not sure news has filtered into them yet. They are almost there. And all of the bench and all of the staff are waiting to run on here for Manchester City referee Mike Dean has looked at his watch for the first time most of the people here weren't even alive the last time Manchester City enjoyed this moment 44 years ago they all run into the centre and Liam Gallagher is here for example from Oasis fame he wasn't even born the last time in 1968 Roberto Mancini was three this is what it means and they can't do anything about the hundreds and hundreds of City fans coming onto the pitch now. What a knife edge, what a game. I think we should make the point that QPR, I think, is safe, well, even though they've lost today. But these are amazing scenes at the Etihad Stadium and Manchester City are champions for the third time in their history. Mike Ingham uh, with Danny Mills. There you had Pat Murphy in that little mix as well. Um, yourself, John. And it's extraordinary, isn't it, to think you had Leicester winning the title in 2016. Arsenal, the Invincibles in 2004, just for you, Buncey. We had Sergio Aguero's iconic goal in 2012 to win Manchester City their first league title in 44 years. And Liverpool's comeback against AC Milan to win the 2005 Champions League final. So if you're a Leicester fan, an Arsenal fan, a Man City fan or a Liverpool fan, those are your defining moments Absolutely. probably of the last 30 years. So what was it, that, again, that made us say, right, well, we can't have a top 10 made up entirely of football moments. Mm. So why not? Why, why did none of those make the top 10, John? I guess it must be the nature of the way that Manchester United won that treble. And I know Manchester City fans will say, well, what about our treble? But, mm. you know, first is big, isn't it? Being the first to do it, yep. yeah. it does, does give it 
that edge, I, I feel. Mm. You could make a strong case historically. any of those four or five being in the top ten. Oh, without, comfortably. Without, Absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we could easily be, we could have easily just played a 30-second or 20-second clip of the treble, United's treble, and switch one of those in with, without a doubt. Because in all fairness, there was nothing between the commentary. Every single commentary was absolutely brilliant, spine-tingling, brilliant stuff. Which one of, of those four, John, if you were a random voter, let's put John under pressure, let's put him under pressure. <laughs> if you were a random voter, we stopped you on the street, which one of those four... Which one of those made you gulp the most, John? So the, the, Liv- can, the it- Liverpool fans who come up and poke you in the chest yeah. next time you're at Anfield say, why did you not put the 2005 Champions League win What made you gulp the, the most? Top 10? I still I do think it's Barcelona. I mm. think it's 99, yeah. which which is part of the reason why it is actually in the top 10. And, you know, Istanbul is Istanbul. I mean, <laughs> absolutely <Yeah>. incredible. <laughs> it's a penalty shootout. To me, that, you know, winning it yeah. in 90 minutes... It's, you want the, you want the unexpected the drama. I, mean, I know, you know they've come from 3-0 down <laughs> yeah. to eventually win it. But that's probably why it would swing it for me. Let me just ask a quick question, and I know, we're, I know we're tight on time. I'd love to know what was said by the five live commentators at half-time in Istanbul. What was said as they followed? Because you remember, you remember, you remember that everybody well, was smiling and happy. Funny you should say that, Steve. Go on, John. Because I remember Alistair Yeomans, who was the producer in Istanbul, trying to make a case to Alan and Mike, who were commentated, uh, who were commentating that night, and he was, shall we say, brushed off at the notion <laughs> that Liverpool could possibly come back. Oh, that's this. brilliant. <laughs> but you would think, you know, you can't, you can't argue, can you? Really, it's three 0 down. But, but I mean, the in, the other interesting thing that strikes me about about this is that it's getting the moment. I think Leicester's title win in 2016 is arguably the greatest achievement in Premier League history, as as actually as Pat Murphy said in in that bit of commentary there. But the moment that they won it was an equaliser by Eden Hazard for Chelsea against Mm. Tottenham. Mm. And they were watching, weren't they, in Jamie Vardy's house, I think, wasn't it? The the Leicester City players. So to not actually be on the field of play (laughs) to, to win it. As an Arsenal fan, what do you remember about that 2004, that three four season? I remember uh, I was I was at various games that season. It was a busy time, but I remember thinking really early in the season there is something special about this side. It was I covered those matches as a fan, also in the press box, and there was something different. There was something different building, and um, yeah, it was it was it was glorious. I mean, sadly, they, there's a lot of people dining out on it still, and we've <laughs> we've moved on an awful long way since then. Well, we started this football section with a European Championship in England. We'll end it in the same way, but a very different outcome. At number six, you voted for the most recent moment in our top ten. It had been 56 years since England's men won the 1966 World Cup. From then, England's men and women had suffered heartbreak after heartbreak. But on a sunny afternoon in late July 2022, England beat Germany after extra time at Wembley once again. This time, it was the Lionesses who ruled. So corner to be taken from this right-hand side. England have the white shirts there, camped by the penalty spot. Corner delivered. England almost gets something on it. Oh, it's missed. And it's stabbed in at the second attempt. And surely Chloe Kelly could have won it an extra time for England. She rips off her shirt. She whirls it around her head. The substitutes are on the pitch. to play. It has to be now or never for Germany. They've got to get the ball over the halfway line otherwise it's all over. Nella Brooms, the goalkeeper, picks it up, throws the ball out in front of her. Ten seconds to play. Brooms raises her arm in the air, plays the ball to the edge of the penalty area. England win the first contact with Scott. It's helped on towards the halfway line. No! Four years of hurt. 
Out of 56 long years, it is glory against Germany once again. And this time, it yields history of its own because the Lionesses have finally won their first major trophy. England are European champions. Vicky Sparks commentating there and timing that music peak hmm. to perfection. Vicky, I mean, what a day. Thank you so much for joining us. What are your reflections and memories on that day? Hello. Oh, it's so great to be with you. And do you know what? I'm actually quite emotional listening back to that because it brings it all back, doesn't it? And, you know, you talk about the timing. It, it's interesting. I, I remember actually getting some advice from John ahead of the final because we knew, didn't we? We knew that this could be a moment of history for England as a country and for the Lionesses in particular, this first major trophy. And given how well they played throughout the tournament, we knew this could be it. And I remember getting some advice from John because obviously he's commentated on so many huge games and so many huge occasions about how to capture that moment. And I remember you saying, John, that just in the build up to it, just, you know, reflect on what you might want to say and, and it will come to you. At some point it will come to you. And it was actually, I think it was around the semi final against Sweden and I was in my hotel room I think in Sheffield and was just deciding to soundtrack, obviously getting into the mood for the commentary. And I have to admit, I did put on Three Lions 98. It was only the semi-final stage, but but I put it on because for me, the first tournament I ever really engaged with after I got into football as a young child was France 98. So that was the, the version of Three Lions that, that, really, that really got to me. And it was listening to that that was such an emotive track for, for me as a young football fan. It was just that no more years of hurt and, and no more need for dreaming. So I'd have that in mind if they did do it. But then the fact that, and you never know what they're going to play, you know, it could have been Sweet Caroline. But the <laughs> fact that as I was saying all of this, I could feel it building. And yes, I thought, let's try and time it. And uh, yeah, then the crowd took over and did the rest. We've had some great football commentaries on the programme already tonight. We've heard from Mike Ingham, we've heard from Alan Green. You think about Brian Butler, you think about Peter Jones, who were their mm. predecessors. We've heard from John as well. And John, Vicky is the one who got to call England winning a major championship. And I, rem I remember why it was that uh, it was nice to talk to Vicky before that, because, of course, I'd been in a similar position the year before. Mm. I think we spoke about that, Vicky, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, when, when, did. when it was the final for the men in 2021. And I remember the kind of things that I was thinking in advance of that. Of course, England, England didn't win it at Wembley on that occasion. But uh, a year later, Vicky, you got to, uh, you got to bring it all to the fore. Vicky, can I ask you and John a question here? It's about it's about those words for that finishing line, for that final whistle, for that final mm. bell. I remember Andrew Castle talking about when he was preparing for Andy Murray to win Wimbledon for the first time, and how he just he was angst over that what he would say on mm. air. So, John, let's let's say going into the European final this summer. Okay, have you got some lines worked out? And did you have some lines worked out, Vicky? Like on the back of your hand, or were they were they inside your head? Well, as I think I probably said to Vicky on on that morning at Wembley, which of course turned out to be the day that it was in 2021, which was a defining day of a different type. I remember walking out of the hotel, going to Wembley, and thinking, I don't know what I'm going to say. I don't know what I'm going to say if they win it. But I'd say that what I always fall back on. And I might have said this to you, Vicky. The most famous piece of commentary in this country is mm. Kenneth Wollstone home saying what he sees for when yeah. that moment when England won the mm. World Cup in 1966 it's nothing clever it's nothing special he says what he sees and the emotion around that tournament Vicky and, and I I found myself becoming really emotional for reasons that I couldn't really put my finger on at the time when the Lionesses won and then I thought it was because of all the teams that have gone before all the women's team sport that didn't get the coverage that didn't have that crowd that didn't have that noise at Wembley mm. going back you know the 30 years that Five Live have been on air and you know kind of a bit further back to the start of my my broadcasting career and this was a this has been a, a really significant few years I think and and, and in a way mm. the Lionesses winning brought it all to a glorious peak. Yeah, and I think that's such a good point, Ellie, because when you speak to not just women in football, but women across sport, I think there was a huge emotional connection with that. You know, it wasn't just recognition for, for the Lionesses and the wonderful achievement that it was, but it was also recognition of 
excellence of women in sport. And I think you're right. I think that did cut across disciplines, not just within football, but for, for so many women who have worked so hard and been outstanding athletes. We don't want to say that that recognition never happens. I mean, I think the athletics and the Olympics and, and you know, in tennis in particular, mm. I think there are sports where women have cut through the mainstream for a long time and, and very much are celebrated. But I think to see that happen in football, to see a sold out crowd at Wembley for a European championship final to see England do it in the most dramatic fashion as well against Germany you know it had all the ingredients and I think that is one of the reasons why why it cut across and it meant so much to people well actually let's have a listen to some of those great moments in in women's sport or featuring sports women since 2017 because actually if you break down our top 30 after 2017 there were more women's sporting moments in the top 30 than there were men's guy quad on strike shrub soul in now both for Bolton! Six wickets for Anya Shrubsall, England's hero. England win the World Cup in front of a packed house at Lords. Who go nuts in the crowd? England in a huddle. Listen to that noise for an England women's team winning a World Cup on home soil in 2017. Can you imagine this team 12 months ago? Complete upheaval, changed this team. They believed they had a team that could make this World Cup final and win, and they have done it. I'm sat here with a tear in my eye because I'm very proud. As an English player, proud to watch those girls go out there and deliver. And wow, what a performance. Championship point number three. Serve out. What is an ace? She's done it with an ace. She's down on the floor. Emma Redekano is the US Open champion at the age of 18. She came through qualifying. She has not dropped a set. 20 straight sets of tennis. She cannot believe it, but believe it she must. The fairy tale in New York. Emma Redekano is the US Open champion with a straight set 6-4, 6-3 win. What a performance from Emma Redekano. So clutch under pressure. She's just a phenomenal talent. But, you know, to deliver that sort of performance today, I think is another level. She is an absolute champion. She's won the US Open at the age of 18, the first qualifier ever to even make it to the final. And she's won the tournament with the tennis that got her there under pressure. She was unbelievable tonight. And I think it's just the full package. Coming to the second last in the Grand National, Rachel Blackmore jumps to the front on Manila Times. Chased by a rank outsider, Balco de Flo. These two are stable mates. One's really fancied, one's a huge outsider. Manila Times at the last from Balco de Flo. Burrow Saint in any second now are the only other two winners who can give Manila Rachel Blackmore, anything to worry about. These four are clear now from Disco Rama and Far Class. They're on to the running now, down to the famous elbow. No female rider has won the Grand National. Rachel Blackmore is out in front. She's just ebbing away energy-wise. Balco Flow in second place. Any second now is back in third position. But one of the great Grand National stories being told on this cold April afternoon. Rachel Blackmore becomes the first female rider to win at the Grand National. What an amazing story. Well, that was Rachel Blackmore winning the Grand National called home by John Hunt. So we heard Gigi Salmon commentating on Emma Raducanu winning the US Open and Alison Mitchell and Ebony Rainford Brent at Lords in 2017 as England's women won the Cricket World Cup. And, and it wasn't the first time, obviously, that England's women had won the Cricket World Cup. They'd done it before, but never at a sellout Lords. And that, for me, was the significance of that moment. A bit like the noise that we heard at Wembley for the Lionesses was that, that fact that in the early years of Five Live, there were not very many great, I mean, as Vicky said, plenty of individual moments featuring sportswomen, but hardly any team sports because women's team sport just did not get 
the credit that it deserved, but it didn't get the funding mm. that it deserved for all that time as well. And it took, in some ways, actually our colleagues on BBC TV to say, right, we're going to put that out there. It may not be getting the best crowds at the moment. It needs more funding. But by putting it on the screens, it then meant that sponsors came in, that funding came in. And actually, for me, that has almost been the biggest change, actually, of the last 30 years, is the growth of women's team sport from the 2012 Olympics. We had the, the Rio gold medal in, in hockey, which I think we might hear a bit later on, but, you know, from, from the 2012 Olympics onwards, it came to the fore much more. You needed a leap of, a leap of faith and you needed, as you say, a combination of people. A bit of a perfect storm of it being covered. Suddenly newspapers, which is obviously my background. In the 1990s, there were some female columnists, there were some, there were, there were some female writers as such, but nothing like there is now. And women's sport was, if we pulled out any random Monday editions of the Daily Telegraph from, from 1992, uh, 93, 94, 95, there's next to no women's sport in there. Let's get that absolutely right. So it took a leap of faith. Radio, television and also newspapers. But it also took a leap of faith by most of the men running all of those institutions. Let's get that absolutely mm. right to cover that particular sport. And you, you talk about 2012, Ellie, the coverage at 2012. I know it was a great Olympics for, for Britain, brilliant Olympics for London, great Olympics for East London, but it was a superb Olympics for British women. Yeah, and to change the focus slightly mm. and bring it back to our gig, broadcasting, what a change there's yeah. been over the course of these 30 years. I mean, you were there, Ellie, Charlotte Nickel, of course, mm -hmm. back in, in my early days, the early days of Five Live, and of course we had many female colleagues behind the scenes. Joanne Watson, of course, would appear on air, off air, back in those times, but... Female football commentators. I know. Well, and that's that's why I'm, I admire Vicky so much, actually, and Alison Mitchell, who we heard there, and people like Jackie Oatley, who was, you know, a real pioneer for, for as, as a woman football commentator, um, Gigi Salmon as well, and Sarah Orchard in rugby. And Vicky, for you, I mean, I didn't have the... Op well, I mean, I probably would have had the opportunities to commentate, but it wasn't seen when I first started out as something that women did. You know, we were just about allowed to report on football matches, although you get a few mm. people objecting to that, present programmes talking about men's sport. And it was mostly men's sport that we were talking about back then. There wasn't much women's sport. But actually, for you, I don't know what for you was the most significant thing and what made you think I can become a football commentator specifically rather than a presenter or a reporter. Yeah, I think I was fortunate to be around when Five Live got the rights to the WSL back in 2014. And they used it as an opportunity to develop people who were already within the BBC, maybe working for local radio, as I was at the time, men and women who had had a bit of commentary experience, but but wanted to develop in that area. So I'd done a little bit of commentary with BBC Radio London, had reported for them for a long time, but had just done my first commentary with them. And then this opportunity came along to to get involved or apply to be on this scheme with the, with the WSL coverage. So so that's how I and, and Robin Cowan, of course, who, who does such a brilliant job with the Lionesses for, for BBC TV and, and elsewhere on Match of the Day, we both came through that scheme essentially. But yeah, I think I was quite fortunate growing up in that I just felt accepted because I loved football so as a fan firstly and then within the industry and you know as you say J Jackie Oatley had done much of the day but she was the only woman really who, who'd done football commentary but I think I still felt inspired maybe not commentary per se but in in terms of reporting and certainly enjoying the commentary of, of people like John and you know there's there's so many to mention in, in that category it just it didn't really occur to me that there was any difference between somebody who likes football that's a man and wants to go into broadcasting and somebody that likes football and is a woman and wants to go into broadcasting and you know I, I don't I don't see myself as a female commentator I just see myself as a commentator the only prerequisite is loving the sport and loving broadcasting and working hard to improve and to develop your skills that should be open and is open to everybody. Vicky, thank you very much indeed. Um, very well done. And the Lionesses are number six in our top 10 countdown as voted for by you. Well, we've just been talking football, John's specialist subject. So, Buncey, we're going to indulge you on boxing. So many big moments could have made our top 30. Here's the one which did. Lennox Lewis taking on Mike Tyson back in 2002. 
Lewis misses now Tyson. Oh, look, Tyson almost went down to a right uppercut. Now, what's the referee doing this time? He's pushed Lewis away. What on earth is he doing? He's giving Tyson a standing eight count. Tyson ducked below waist level. He's given Tyson a standing eight count, and he's saved Tyson there. The right eye of Tyson is very, very badly swollen here, and I think this fight is coming towards its conclusion. Lennox Lewis is showing that the new will beat the old. Mike Tyson is still in there, bravely going out on his shield. Lewis, a right uppercut and a left hook. Tyson holds on, tries to throw a left hook of his own and holds on and the referee has to split them. Mike Tyson is desperately tired. Lewis ducks as Tyson throws a right hook of desperation. Right uppercut inside from Tyson did land. And Lewis looks tired as he tries to throw the big right hand and he gets it. A right over the top and Tyson is down. His nose is bloodied, his eyes are bloodied and he looks up at the lights above the ring and that is the end of an era, the end of Mike Tyson and Lennox Lewis rules supreme in the eighth round. It is Lennox Lewis by knockout. Well, that was Lewis Tyson with John Rawling. I mean, just Steve, sum up what that meant, actually, for Lennox Lewis to beat Mike Tyson at that point. Well, it was a fight that we were pushing for in boxing for years and years and years. And then it came close. Then they had a press conference in New York to formally announce it. And they got into a scuffle and Mike Tyson bit a chunk out of Lennox's leg. Fight got pushed back. Finally, it was made. But it was made under a couple of different rules. There were there were two lines of policemen in the ring separating the boxers. It was screened simultaneously on two giant American broadcasters. So there were two MCs. There was two of everything. And there was hate, there was vitriol, there was nastiness. It was absolutely vile, that period in Memphis. I loved every single second <laughs> of it. It was one of the greatest weeks of my sport in life. The fight itself was a letdown. Lennox near enough played with him and took him out. And and what John was you know, reading between the lines of what John said there in that commentary is it was very... Very sad seeing even that Mike Tyson go down the way he did because when he went down, John, it was final, it was horrible Mm. and it was bloody. And I have to say as well, John, that, you know, I'm I'm not one for buying fights on the te- on the telly mm. <laughs> but I will always try and listen you know if it's not a ridiculous time in the morning and I've got to get up the, the next day because actually I think on, on the radio you can kind of enjoy that that visceral sense of of just you know gladiators going at each other mm. but without without the blood and the core. <laughs> Because there's such a lot to go at, mm. isn't there? And as Steve suggested, you're so close. Also, some of the great broadcasters have commentated on boxing way before Five Live, mm. going back Des Lynham. Harry Carpenter. Uh, Harry Carpenter, um, Eamon, Andrews, Eamon Andrews, of course. It's a big one. Yeah. And of course, in America as well, boxing commentary on the radio is going iconic. Back to the 50s, some of those Rocky Marciano fights with the big mic, the giant yeah. silver microphones. Oh, that's yeah. just glorious. And voice. we heard it there in that clip, that just that ringing of the bell, yeah. the crowd and the ringing of the bell, and you can hear the punches. It's, it's, <laughs> it's I know, great, it, great it, radio. It, it, back to the countdown now and on to number five. Now, England's men's cricketers had never won a 50-over World Cup. Captain Owen Morgan, though, had revolutionised the side after years of failure in ODI World Cups. They took on New Zealand in the final at Lords in 2019 and what a final it turned out to be. Two runs off this ball, New Zealand win. One yeah. ball, one run and England win. It's come to this. Here's the last ball of the World Cup final. Archer bowls it, it's clipped away into the leg side. They're going to come back for the second. The throw is picked up, they throw to the quicker keeper's end. He's yeah. not out, I think he's run out. England think he's run out. England are convinced he's been run out. They're celebrating. It was thrown to the right end, to Butler's end. We had to work hard to take those bails off. England are sure they've got him. Through a tie in the tiebreaker. But it's England's game on more boundaries in the match. New Zealand looked devastated, Guptill's on his haunches. I think he knows, I think he knows, as England do. Here's the replay, wait for the cheer. We're watching Butler gather the ball. He's got a bit of work to do to take it to the stumps. Wait now, listen. That tells you that England have won the World Cup. The fireworks going 
taking off the grandstand. It'll be confirmed on the screen. Out. And Drofa Archer has done it from the most unpromising start. He's on his knees. Well done, young man. My word. What an effort that is. Well, that was our cricket correspondent, Jonathan Agnew. I mean, Jonathan, goodness me, what unbelievable memories of that day at Lords, and made harder by the fact that you had to wait for that replay to absolutely 100% confirm yeah. what it's everybody at Lords back. thought. Yeah, it's funny listening back, but of course, it was impossible from our angle. We had a, the bats are running away from us, 100 yards away. There's all the dust. is out by about I don't know, two or three feet. There's no way in our commentary box you can see if it's definitely out. But of course, these days, the problem is that the umpire doesn't make a decision on the field. So you'll have heard there in the course of all that, with all the excitement, a little bit of classic commentator filling while I'm waiting for the, <laughs> I'm waiting for the verdict on the screen because, you know, you could tell from the body language that it was almost probably out. But did Butler knock the bales off with his, with his arm? I mean, there's so many different things that could have happened for it not to have been out. So you had to wait. You had to wait. And finally, thank goodness, it came up on the screen and everything looked right and it was taken cleanly and obviously got towards out of his ground. But it was just an utterly exhausting day and the most incredible climax. And you can go all the way through all the things that happened in that, in that World Cup final. And to come down to that, you know, another tie in the tiebreaker situation, well, I don't think we'll ever see anything like it again, frankly. We've been talking about these are the defining moments, the defining moments in 30 years of Five Lives history. And the significance of that game as well, because, you know, I've, I've said, we, we talked already about the women winning the World Cup in 2017, you know, which was not the first time they'd won it. But for the men to have never won... The 50-over World Cup, I mean, it almost almost felt like it had to happen. It had to be lifted from them, this weight of, of never having, having won it. Yes, it did. And if you think that they started the cycle bottom, and so they'd actually rebuilt this whole team, this, 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 actually quite a tight squad, from scratch, largely, from an absolute hiding in the previous World Cup. And, of course, they got rid of people like Jimmy Anderson and Stuart Broad, and they went off in this new direction with Owen Morgan, the captain, and sort of breathing new life into things, really. And it's funny, looking back on it, that one of Owen Morgan's best friends is Brendan McCullum. You, you can see where a lot of the thought processes came from. There's no doubt that Morgan spoke a lot to McCullum, and we know what McCullum, McCullum's all about because of his basball. So you can see how there was a clearing of minds and how they charted this progress. And Jonathan, what about you describing that from someone who has been the man in the arena to describing what you will very well know is a defining moment well, and the that's adrenaline an that's involved in that? Yeah, because you really appreciate, therefore, what, what Archer did that day. And it particularly to come back from that bad start of the wide and the six, that they're only wanting 15, the pressure that he's under. And Lords, when well, you can hear the, the noise there at, at the back, I mean, it was just, I'd, I'd never known an atmosphere like it at Lords. Um, it was just rocking. And of course, there'd been the gap between the innings and inevitably Sweet Caroline and all that stuff going on. You know, it was it was a, a, a remarkable atmosphere. And yes, I mean, for Archer to come up and uh, particularly to, to get over that poor start that he had in a team that he really didn't know very well. Um, all of those things, and then players didn't know him very well. You know, at least if someone that you've you've, you've been with for the, the four-year program, you know, you'll know what makes them tick. And when they need an arm around them, or when they need a, you know a firmer word or something, people didn't really know Joffrey Archer at all. And just to come in and do that was absolutely extraordinary. Well, it was an incredible day of sport that day as well. I, I remember it really well because the World Cup final. I actually started on breakfast. We did the breakfast program from Lords that morning, um, and then. The final was on Five Live and the Wimbledon men's final, an epic Federer Djokovic final, that was on uh, Five Sports Extra at exactly the same time. Um, I have to say, uh, Jonathan, that, that when it came to deciding what made our top 10, I almost felt like I was trying to choose between my children, between that World Cup final in 2019. And something that just happened just a few weeks later at Headingley, which was part of our top 30. Two balls, two runs, one wicket. Can't have a tie, can we? In goes Lyon. Bowls, reverse That's sweep, it. fielder, fielder. Over the no, 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 no. He set off. Oh, oh no. Lyon's no. dropped it. Lyon's dropped it. No. He was run out by yards, no. and Lyon has dropped the ball. No. Leach survives. He's set off for that run. I don't know why. Stokes wasn't going anywhere. He should have been run out by two yards. 
Wow. And Leach dropped, uh, Leach was well short and Lyon dropped the ball. He dropped the ball. Oh, they're showing it on the screen. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Wow. <laughs> That's just spoiled it, hasn't it? It's still two to win. It's the last ball of the oh. over. What Stokes going to do? He's going to slog it. In goes Lyon. Bowls to him. He does oh, slog no, it. No. Appeal for leg before wicket. It's on Paul Wilson. They're beseeching oh, no. it. He's no getting reviews. it. Not out. No. No reviews. Not out. No, no reviews. Umpire Wilson has said not out. Oh, ho, ho. From a sweep. If that is out, with the way Wilson's had this. Oh. Oh. What an over again. What drama. But still not over yet. And Australia had their moment. They had their moment. If that's hitting the stumps. Oh. Lyon wanted that. Why wouldn't you give that? Lyon <laughs> because wanted that. Because England have reviews. Well, that's a good point. No, because then his umpire's call. Then well, it's, then it's out. That's then, a good it? point. <laughs> oh, dear. <clears throat> right, oh. OK. 3.58 for nine. Stokes on strike. England need one to win. And in comes Pat Cummins from the far end. He bowls to Stokes, who hammers it for four! And stands there with the back raised. I can't believe we've seen that. That is the most extraordinary innings ever, ever been played by an Englishman. He punches the air, his helmet's off. He was hit on that helmet this morning. Bits flew off all over the place. And he's slumped to his knees. One Australian's there, it's Lyon, I think, who knew, he knew he could have run him out. He's got his hands on his knees, he's feeling dreadful. One or two teammates go and pat him on the back, that won't help him. Well, I mean, Jonathan, I've got... <laughs> that's my winner, I'm sorry. That's, that's, it was that's beca- beating the World Cup for me. Right, well, controversial. Like, yeah. The correspondent says that, that, that should have been in the top ten. Come on, a test match to finish like yeah. that, you know, and, and, and 70, 70 odd needed. And the last pair together, and, and, you know, John mentioned what it's like when you've been there yourself, you know, and, and you know what batting and Jack Leach's situation is like, that, from my perspective. That just had everything. And there's yeah. a reference there to the tie, which, of course, reflects back to the World Cup. Final, I'm Paul Wilson, who had an absolute <laughs> shocker of shocker of a series. I mean, you knew every decision he gave was wrong, and so that's why again the shout of Umpire Wilson goes in. It's that little, it's that bit of extra drama that adds to it. And of course, he got it wrong. You know, Stokes has plumb, he should have given it out. So there's all those things that just to win a Test match and the quality of Stokes's innings to play as he did with every single fielder on the boundary. I know an absolute, absolutely. Dead confident. I will never see, never see an innings like that again, and a finish like that again. So I'm sorry, everyone. No, I'm sort of, I'm a, that 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 is, is my own personal winner out of those two for that year. I have to say that as well. We had so many um, videos sent to us on yeah. on TMS as well because, of people because test where they grabs were because it was a bank holiday, wasn't it? And yeah, so people it was, were watching on the beach and listening. Well, listening test, on the beach. Test cricket crucially. gets you. Mm. Test cricket grabs you, and you can't help but get absolutely sucked into it. And just one other thing, you know, this is all about radio. The number of people who know where they are when they listen to a dramatic moment on the radio, mm. because your brain has to work. You can sit there and watch the telly. And it tells you what's going on. It's all very nice and so on. You see the pictures. But when you're listening to a radio commentary of something dramatic, your brain has to work. You have to imagine and see it, picture it yourself, what we are lucky enough to be describing to you. You have to actually work. And it burns. It's there. It makes an imprint in your mind. And so the number of people come to me, I was there then that happened. Or I remember that. Radio has that power that television doesn't. Well, Jonathan, I think we're going to make you happy now because at number four in our list, it's more cricket, it's test cricket and perhaps the defining Ashes series of modern times. England striving for this last wicket. They've been doing that for a while. Harmison comes up and bowls and Kasparovic goes back and parries one as he caught down the leg side. There's an appeal for catches out. What an incredible test match. That is astonishing stuff. And quite fittingly, Steve Harmison takes the winning wicket and Geraint Jones takes a very good catch down the leg side. What a phenomenal test match. 127 for seven. If anyone can do it for Australia, it's Shane Warne. But he won't be able to do it all in this over. 
England need two to win. Warren comes in and bowls to Giles. It turns it away through mid wicket. That's it. England have won the Test match. The batsmen complete their two. They're raising their backs as they do so. Oh, well, what a climactic finish to another remarkable Test match. The third in succession in this outstanding series. And who would have thought it? That England, with one Test match to play, now lead in this series by two matches to one. And it's unique. And that the Ashes are going to be secured by England by some sort of ceremonial removing of the bales by the two umpires. No one in the crowd actually knows what's going on here. There's been no uh, public address announcement about this. We've just got uh, inside word up here. This is what's going to happen. They are inspecting for light. They're really just going through the motions here. The umpires are going to their respective ends. And in the most extraordinary manner, the bales are removed by umpire Bowden. He throws one in the air. And England have won the Ashes. Finally. In the most bizarre ending. Oh, let the crowd speak for themselves. And I'm now going into the England dressing room. Well, there'll be great scenes of celebration. In fact, the players are going through to shake hands with each other. Duncan Fletcher, England coach, you've won the Ashes. Yeah, it's fantastic. Fantastic. I mean, there's not much you can really say. I think at the end of the day, the players must be very proud of themselves and England must be very proud of their cricketers. Well, that was Duncan Fletcher talking to Jonathan Agnew. So, so I kind of hadn't taken that on board, Jonathan, that actually that defining moment of the 2005 Ashes, bizarre though it was, you were actually commentating pitch side or yes. on the pitch rather than well, I in was, the commentary box. I was at the other end of the ground. Yes, I've got those wireless microphones you can have these days. And I was just outside the England dressing room and we were told how this game was going to end. If you remember, the gloom came down and it was always going to end up a bit, a bit messily. But how do you do it when you've got the ashes at stake? How are you going to create a moment? And so that's what they decided. The umpires would go out, have a look at the light, say that's not good enough and take a bail off. And that's it, end of the game. And therefore the crowd could, could react. You couldn't just have a PA announcement, oh, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, bad light, stop play. And that's it, and England have won the Ashes. And that would not have worked, would it? So they had to create something. But the funny thing was that Duncan, I managed to grab there, and I said, I'm going to go into the England dressing room. And actually, I opened the door and there's no one there because they were all, they'd were all they all gone across to the Australian side. And Duncan, I managed to grab just like that um, because, well, it's nice to see that that little sort of tradition was continued. And that's where it was. But that was, that was an incredible series. As we know, you know, the first test started just as all the others had with Glenn McGrath taking a load of wickets in Australia winning. And then, of course, he trod on the ball before a ball was bowled at Edge Bass. And that dramatic finish where he got two Australians commenting Jim Maxwell and Jeff Lawson. Why are they commentating? Because of the silly tradition that we have on Test Match Special that the winning commentator calls his team home and we'd given up. So we said to Jim, in you go, you, know, you go, and go and call Australia home and Jeff, you go in there beside him. And suddenly they're commentating on, a, on an England win, which wasn't quite what Jim had anticipated. Then you had the great old Trafford game with 20 odd thousand mm-hmm. people couldn't get in. That Trent Bridge test you heard there, Matthew Hoggard hitting Lee for four and the most unusual and unlikely thing to get England up towards the target. And then, of course, that, that last test match as well with Kevin Peterson's brilliant 100. So that series really did set up English cricket. I mean, it was very disappointing that the the authorities decided to take it off free to air uh, the, the following year. It was gone. I mean, there was just that opportunity that I think the game the game badly missed. It happened again in 2019 after Stokes, but it was it was COVID this time that really nailed it. But 2005 cricket was on a launch pad as a result of that series, and uh, it's a shame that it, was, it became restricted after that. Jonathan, thank you very much indeed. Jonathan Agnew, one of the other key voices, I think, of Five Lives, 30 years as well. We're heading into the top three then. We've got Johnny Wilkinson's drop goal, Andy Murray's Wimbledon win in 2013 and Super Saturday at London 2012. So what have you voted for as your number one? Find out after the latest news. Listen on BBC Sounds. This is BBC Radio 5 Live. With the BBC News on 5 Live, I'm Giuliano Casaday. A draft report uncovered by the BBC shows the post office had been shown evidence by 2017 that losses at branches could be due to errors in the Horizon IT system or remote tampering. In spite of that report, written by consultants Deloitte, the post office spent £100 million fighting sub-postmasters in court. 
46 people have died after a bus plunged off a bridge into a ravine in South Africa and caught fire. An eight-year-old boy was the only survivor. The bus had come from neighbouring Botswana. The founder of the cryptocurrency exchange, FTX, Sam Bankman-Fried, has been sentenced to 25 years in prison by a court in New York for fraud and money laundering. Prosecutors say it's one of the biggest financial frauds in US history. And ministers have confirmed they're delaying plans to ban no-fault evictions in England. The 2019 Conservative Manifesto pledge will only come into force once courts are deemed to be ready to handle a potential increase in eviction cases. Welcome back to Five Live Sport as we're looking back on the 30 defining moments of the last 30 years. We'll get back to the countdown shortly, but first we've witnessed some remarkable achievements from some big international names. They're into the last furlong. I don't think you'll hear a word I'm saying because you'll realise that Fujiyama, Crest and Frank Hittori have the lead, but Northern Fleet are going after him and Northern Fleet and Pat Henry are challenging. It's neck and neck, right for strike. Fujiyama, Crest is going to win it. Frankie Gatori, seven. And in second place, Northern Fleet. And then came Miller's Wacky and Ivers Flutter. That is history made. The crowd are running towards the unsaddling enclosure to greet today's hero. He's been a hero many times. I don't think any jockey has ever run, won seven races in one day. The last time that six wins in a row was done in 1957. So seven wins in seven races. And just to recap, Wall Street in the two o'clock, Diffident in the 235, Mark of Esteem, the big one at 320, Decorated Hero in the 355, Faithfully in the 430, Lock Angel in the five o'clock for Ian Balding, and now for Michael Stout, 535, the crowning glory, Fujiyama Crest makes all the running to give Frankie an absolutely fantastic day, and the crowd at Ascot something they will never ever forget. This is the men's 100 metres final at the World Championships with the Olympic champion Usain Bolt in lane number four. And they're away first time and Bolt gets a good start but so too does Tyson Gay. Bolt hits the front with 40 metres gone. Bolt pulls away from Gay in second place. Paul in third. 9.58 seconds. The Beijing magic has been transplanted here to Berlin. He is already round on to the back straight. Such is the pace of this man. Both arms outstretched, because that's what he did. He flew home to victory. The Olympic champion has become the world champion, blowing minds all over the stadium once again. Usain Bolt, the winner, in 9.58 seconds. Stunning stuff. And this is to break yet another record. The record set by Raymond Floyd and Jack Nicholas of 17 under here at the Masters. All is quiet around the 18th. This for a 69 for Tiger Woods. In it goes! And he clenches his fist twice and Tiger Woods is Masters champion 1997, the youngest ever Masters champion, 21 years of age, and sport in general and golf in particular has found itself a new and exciting superstar. He could become the best there's ever been. His story is just beginning. Well, we heard there Frankie de Tori winning seven races in one day at Ascot. Usain Bolt's world record 100 metre run in 2009. And Tiger Woods winning his first major in the 1997 Masters. And you've got to say, John Murray, that Tony Adamson called that absolutely mm. correctly. And I mean, what incredible to mm. hear the great Peter Bromley commentating as well on horse racing. It's just a reminder, isn't it? The, what, what we do, this job that we do, that we are that we're right there. We've got the classic ringside seat, Steve, to to watch and see the changing of the times and the changing of the stars. And I remember listening to Tony, you know, who had such a lovely way with his his style of commentary. I remember standing again, must have been covering the match behind at St Andrews. The clubhouse there, the first in the 18th, and I remember Tony describing how he was watching Jack Nicholas finishing off his round on the 18th as Tiger Woods was teeing off on the first. But it's that degree of privilege that we have 
as you guys as commentators, me as a pundit co-commentator. That's a privilege. That I mean, it's it's just a position. It's an enviable position. We should never ever take it lightly. We should mention as well that Mike Costello commentary of Usain Bolt nine point five eight. How do you commentate on a hundred meters race in less than ten seconds? You're asking the wrong man <laughs> there. Yeah, uh, I marvel. You know, some of the great athletics commentators we've had, whether it's John Rawling, Ian Dark, Alan Parry, when you've got that restricted amount of time, you know, to think of the, the Ben Johnson race, everything that was going on in that. Mm. Economy of words, but meaning of big words. Yeah. I'm wondering really if, if I might give Costello some stick because really, no disrespects, and don't take this the wrong way, bolt 100 metres were easy. Big geezer, big, big geezer gets in front, stays in front and wins. For God's sake, that's easy. Whereas you're absolutely right. The Ben Johnson 100 metres, there's 17, 30, there's 40 stories on that on that track in just under 10 seconds. He's still had it easy and his feet up with a cigar. It's a doddle. Right, we've talked about great international names that have been at the forefront in the last 30 years of Five Live. Bolt, Dettori, Tiger... Some big names in tennis too. So Williams sets herself, serving towards the raw box, towards Angelique Kerber. 5-3, 40 love. Is this the moment? Reaches up, serves down wide, stretcher and Kerber. Short ball, forehand down the line on the approach from Williams, who plays the backhand volley. It drifts in, the stretcher and Kerber, a forehand volley, finishes it off. And Serena Williams is flat on her back on the centre court turf. That is her seventh Wimbledon title, her 22nd Grand Slam singles title. She draws level with Steffi Graf. She has finally made it across the line. There is a great embrace from both Williams and Kerber at the net. They exchange a few words, but this day is all about Serena Williams. She is back. Five live at Wimbledon at quarter past nine. Incredible late night drama here as Nadal serves at Deuce. He's going to have another match point. What a serve from Nadal. He hasn't been known over the years for his serve, but it's the area of his game which has improved immeasurably over the last couple of years. And that could be the serve which does it for him again here at Wimbledon. He's got championship point for the fourth time. He's got the serve into the body here. He'd be mad if he didn't. From the Royal Box end, in front of some of his heroes, Rafael Nadal has championship point for the fourth time in almost total darkness on centre court. Forehand return from Roger Federer, the defending champion. Who next? Federer's Wimbledon reign is over. And Nadal is on his back. The flash bulbs go off like fireworks on centre court. The longest final in history. Surely the greatest final in history. And we have a new champion. The king of play has conquered the grass. He is Rafael Nadal of Spain. Well, we heard Serena Williams winning her seventh Wimbledon along with Rafa Nadal beating Roger Federer in that epic 2008 final. So let's bring in Jonathan Overend, our former tennis correspondent, commentator on some unbelievable moments. Jonathan on Five Live uh, of one of the greatest eras in tennis. Hi, Ali. I, I think you have to say it is the greatest era if it were ever to be repeated. I, I mean, imagine the sort of talent we would have to commentate on. I, I mean, that I would say that decade, 2003 to 2013, Serena and Venus, the Belgians, let's not forget them and the role they played, Justin Ennan and Kim Kleisters. Sampras and Agassi still going at the start of that decade, but then handing on to Djokovic, Federer, and Nadal, and that 2008 final we heard there remains the greatest match I've ever seen. The shot making under pressure, the drama, it was so dark. And that would have been the final game, Ellie. They'd made the decision at seven games all that they could play two more and then it would have to be back the next day. So Nadal to win it there in, in total to Huckness with those flash bulbs. I mean, that's still a memory that I wake in the night seeing those bulbs going off and the, the scoreboard just illuminating through the dark. Incredible moment. And Jonathan, I'm glad that we've got you because it's time to reveal number three in our countdown. And after waiting 77 years, we were made to wait just that little bit longer. Murray at championship point. First serve long. Some spectators thought Murray that was in. The call. Right service line, ball is called out. Oh. Come on. It's a hope. It's it's a hope. It's a hope. I think it's I think it's definitely out. We, well Second after service. 77 years, it wouldn't really be right for Hawkeye to win Wimbledon. 
second serve for Murray on Wimbledon Championship point. Backhand return from Djokovic cross court. Backhand slice from Murray. Forehand from Djokovic. Backhand from Murray down the centre. Backhand slice from Djokovic. Backhand from Murray down the centre again. Djokovic down the centre with the backhand. Drive from Murray is long. Three match points have come and gone. And it's now Deuce. Mr Murray has one challenge remaining. On we go. Deuce on the Murray serve. Hits the sideline. Forehand return from Djokovic. Forehand from Murray. How's he managing to keep playing tennis out there? Backhand cross court from Djokovic. Forehand down the line. Now midcourt forehand from Murray. He snatched it. It's gone into the net. And Djokovic now, oh goodness me, look at Djokovic. He looks like a Bond villain. He's here in front of us. He's got a knowing smile. He's nodding his head. If he had a cat, he'd be stroking it. He's got a break back point. <laughs> Well, I don't like the look of that. Put him in a cloak. Did you see that, John? I saw it. Oh, I couldn't dear. believe what I was seeing. Advantage, Djokovic. A knowing, wry smile from Djokovic. He's a point away from levelling this third set. Murray serves. Four and returns gone long. Wipe that smile off your face. You haven't broken back just yet. Drop shot, Murray. In comes Djokovic. Steers it cross court for an outrageous winner. Absolutely outrageous from Novak Djokovic. Oh, the Djokovic slide. A backhand volley scores. He saved the third break point. Closed him well. Closed him very well. And if he would have waited a little bit longer, that would have been an unbelievable difficult volley. Can't be doing with this. This is amazing stuff. Deuce. Murray puts up a defensive lob. Smash from Djokovic. Murray's going to get another hit. Oh, it's the volley of Djokovic. Here comes Murray. And he swivel it. Into the net goes Djokovic. Unbelievable retrieving from Andy Murray again. This time picking up the smash. The full pelt smash from Djokovic. Making him play one more point. One more shot. And it's that effort, that huge determination, that will to win, which brings up another championship point for Andy Murray. This is it this time. Advantage, Murray. Well, this famous old centre court could be about to go crazy. Murray serves. Here it is. Here it is. Forehand from Murray. Backhand from Djokovic. Into the net. Murray. Murray's the Wimbledon champion. It seems ludicrous to say it. 6 4, 7 5. But a British man has just won Wimbledon. And Andy Murray, 6 4, 7 5, 6 4, has only gone and done it. I can't believe it again. Two slams for Murray now. Just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And the top seed, Djokovic, has been well and truly beaten. And Murray is down on his knees in the forecourt at the far end. He was screaming out to the spectators on the far side. And now he's holding his head. He's bent double. He's just about managed to pick himself up. And when reality dawns, he will have picked himself up as a two-time Grand Slam champion and as a Wimbledon champion. Well, that was Andy Murray ending Britain's 77-year wait for a men's singles Wimbledon champion. And Jonathan Overend, I have to say, I've heard it many times, but that was just such brilliant commentary. And how on earth you managed to have the composure to make jokes about Bond villains in the tension of that 11-minute final game. I mean, you know, my hat, hat comes off to you. <sighs> I mean, it was so nerve-wracking, Ellie. I mean, it was so nerve-wracking. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Here's the main thing. It, it was such a close match in terms of the exchanges between the two and the way the games played out. But actually on the scoreboard, when you reflect on it, it was one-sided. Murray won the first set. Murray won the second set. He went to break up in the third. He served for the championship. And what happened in that last game? 15-love, 30-love, 40-love. I mean, it, it felt simply too comfortable, too good to be true. And of course it was. So then the Djokovic comeback came to life and all those break back points he had. And I said at the time, and I, I maintain it to this day, that if Djokovic had won one of those break points and levelled that third set, Murray wouldn't have won that title. Djokovic would have won from two sets to love down. I don't see any way Andy would have recovered from that. And his arm was shaking. His racket arm was shaking, and yet he still managed to save the breakback points and serve it out for Wimbledon. Simply the greatest thing I've ever seen, and just a, a defining moment. 
You know, uh, you know, Ellie and, and John, when you work with overs, okay, honestly, every single piece of commentary and every single event you go to is like, is close to being a serve or a, or a shot that's going to end a 77-year wait, okay? So, so, and, and this is a compliment. It's a, it's a joy and a pleasure to work with. So when he slipped into the whole Bond routine there, <laughs> I, I, I listen, I wasn't listening to it live, but I would have gone, go on, overs, relax yourself now. He loved it. Listen, he's, he's got a big cheesy grin on his face right Right now, as we're talking about it, because he loved every single second of that, and I could, you, you can just tell over the joy that comes when you're in top form like that. When something like that's happening, you are absolutely on cloud. And I've done I've done hours of him in the studio just around the corner of him here during the Tokyo Olympics at three and four o'clock in the morning. Trust me, his feet don't touch the floor. <laughs> he loves every second of it. But I think as well, Jonathan, the you know people younger listeners listening back to that might think, why did he sound so? incredulous that mm. that a British man mm. had That's won a great point. And, you know, knowing now what we know about multiple Grand Slam winning Olympic champion. But I think this should, Jonathan, this is the, this is the benefit of experience, isn't it? Because you, like older listeners, will have lived through those Henman ag- <laughs> agonies and then same with Murray as well, falling short, falling short. And that's all part of it, isn't it? Absolutely. And I, I mean, I'd go back earlier than him and John. I mean, I remember the days when I'd run back from school uh, in the 80s to try to see if Jeremy Bates could reach the mm. second round. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that. And, and John Lloyd, <laughs> by the way, who's sitting next to you that then. Uh, that's oh, right. Wow. And the, you know, the whole series of, of British players who, as I say, just winning one match at Wimbledon was, was a triumph. Uh, and for, for Murray personally, you're, you're right to highlight the disappointments in his career because he'd lost multiple Grand Slams finals. Remember, 12 months previously, he'd been in tears into Sue Barker's microphone on the court, having lost Wimbledon. But then the Olympics happened and he beat Federer to win the gold medal. And then he won the US Open later that year. An incredible achievement, obviously, to win a first Grand Slam. But we were building, weren't we? We were building towards that moment, that 77-year wait ending. And it just felt right on that day with the sun shining that it would be that day. The stars were aligned in a way and uh, it was just an incredible achievement and one of the, the best matches I've ever seen him play and to deliver that on the day with all those stakes so high hat off to him incredible and I get that sense you know when, when you watch him I mean you watch him the last five or six years overs I'm watching him and I'm going go on Andy go on Andy. it's a different sort of thing like when, when he was when he was younger it was yeah come on Murray come on Murray but now it's like he feels like an old friend an old pal an old injured pal so like, go on go on Andy go on son go on son <laughs> it wasn't always that way no, though, of course was it, it wasn't remember at the start of Andy's career he, he didn't earn many friends well, was, the way was sometimes it? he acted and the way mm. he spoke sometimes and he also followed Tim you know he yeah. followed yeah. Tim and Such Tim was different personalities different personalities way. and Tim was just so loved and adored I mean you know you've been on Henman Hill for God's sake I mean they tried for a million years to call it Murray Mound or whatever it just didn't work <laughs> it was Henman Hill they should have bought they should have built masonettes on it and done away with the damn thing I mean that really just, it's not worked since Tim finished so but, but but the Murray thing is a different kind of love and I'm using that I'm not I'm not using that word lightly and of course, he went on to win Wimbledon for a second time, don't forget, in 2016. He ended that year as well as the world number one. He's won the Davis Cup and he's won back-to-back Olympic gold medals in singles in London and in Rio. I mean, what an incredible achievement it has been. And I thought, I, I, I keep talking to myself in my mind, thinking what, what on earth could possibly happen in Murray's career post-2013 to top that day that we just heard and the answer is nothing nothing ever could because for all his accomplishments nothing will beat that first time winning Wimbledon in 2013 Jonathan great pleasure to have you on with us this evening thank you very much indeed Jonathan Overend uh, who was commentating on our number three moment in our top ten countdown and uh, a knight of the realm Andy Murray and let's move on to another knight of the realm Lewis Hamilton. Last lap for Lewis Hamilton. Under braking is late on the brakes and they can barely see uh, the crowd, the cars, and they drop down the hill and he hasn't got past Sebastian Vettel. He's struggling for grip as he puts his foot on the gas going through the curve of the sole. And Lewis Hamilton has just blown that first opportunity of getting back ahead of Sebastian Vettel. He's got another two miles as the flash bulbs go off, waiting for Felipe Massa, who's got another third of a lap to come. And then he can be crowned 
not only the winner at the Brazilian Grand Prix, but against all the odds, seven points he started adrift of Lewis Hamilton at the start of this race to be crowned world champion in 2008 as well. Here comes Felipe Massa now, up towards the chequered flag, it's out for him. Now he can celebrate victory in the Brazilian Grand Prix. He's won it for a second time, and the noise rises to a crescendo. But I tell you what, they've got a 200 more decibels to come when Lewis Hamilton crosses the line in a few moments' time. Because Massa's won, we know that. He's the world champion if Lewis Hamilton can't get past Sebastian Vettel. Vettel goes round now into Jung Cal. He's three, four five car lengths ahead and there's absolutely no chance for Lewis Hamilton to get back they're throwing their hats into the air in the crowd here at Interlagos because Felipe Massa with Lewis Hamilton coming home to take sixth place is world champion no Lewis Hamilton's up to fifth Lewis Hamilton has made it up to fifth by the end of the line Ferrari think they've won it our timing screen says that Lewis Hamilton's fifth and Timo Glock is sixth and there's confusion at Ferrari but I tell you what the times say Lewis Hamilton is the winner Le the McLaren garage say Lewis Hamilton's the winner Felipe Massa doesn't know what's happened there Lewis Hamilton puts his head his hands over his head and can't believe it and now it's filtered through and now he thinks he's world champion Timo Glock came home sixth Lewis Hamilton couldn't get past Sebastian Vettel but he could get past Timo Glock and that'll do nicely he's world champion in 2008 and I've never seen anything like it well, that was Sir Lewis Hamilton winning his first uh, title in Brazil in 2008 and only his second season in Formula One as well. Um, and it was the first of seven yeah. titles for Sir Lewis. And, and you were hurriedly rushed out there. Weren't you? Well, to, I was there. Into yes. Lagos. Well, I'd, so I'd, I was there for in two thousand and seven um, at Interlagos for, for when he didn't win it, and then in two thousand and eight, so presenting. So at that stage, I was presenting Sunday afternoons on Five Live, so doing a lot of Formula One back in those days. And it was, I mean, you know, BBC budgets being what they were, I think I got there on the Friday night. Did qualifying on Saturday, the race on Sunday, and flew back on Monday. So, so two not very long weekends in Sao Paulo in a row. But I mean, the Interlagos track is just like nowhere else you've ever been because it's a really old fashioned track. You know, the paddock area is, I, I think it's been upgraded a little bit since then, but it's still really kind of quite, quite sort of old fashioned and a, and a, a post war throwback. But I think. You could hear in David Croft's commentary there just that confusion that you just didn't know what had happened in those closing moments. Because, you know, because obviously a lot of it's happening out of sight and the cameras were concentrating on Felipe Massa, cheered on by the Brazilian crowds, crossing the line to win the Grand Prix and they thought to win the World Championship as well. And what they hadn't seen was on the <laughs> penultimate bend, Lewis Hamilton overtaking Timo Glock to finish in fifth place, which gave him enough points to win the championship. You make it sound so simple. It's amazing how many <laughs> of our 30 have endings like that. Mm. I'd say seven, six or seven or eight, some of the best commentators and presenters in the world working in different locations have not really known what's happened. They're <laughs> not really, they're, they're, there's a bit of confusion. You know, there's a little bit of confusion and, and that's one of them. You're putting a cold shiver down my spine. Yeah, it, it's, it's, <laughs> John, it's the worst thing in the world and also, no matter how calm and collected you could be, if there's this ridiculous 98th minute goal and in your case it goes to VAR doesn't matter what you prepared no matter where your head is that's a tricky moment just saying he's a rookie season as well that he could have been By world champion it just, just makes you Ridiculous. think again what an incredible era the Lewis Hamilton era has been in Formula One and maybe with him moving to Ferrari next year he, he will come back but I think Lewis Hamilton absolute 21st century British sporting star isn't he yeah and the way he's just as as the only as the only black driver as well on that starting grid for so many years a real trailblazer in every way well time to get back to the countdown and at number two it's the most famous drop goal in rugby union history can you ever remember sitting in our commentary box rob andrew with more drama and emotion in a match Thank so you. highly charged well if you ever want to win a line out, this is the biggest line out in the history of English rugby. Win it, catch it. They've Dr won it and they start to attack. It's Wilkinson. Cats banged over in midfield, a crunching tackle, but the ball comes back. Johnny's going for 
a drop goal. This could rival the Rob Andrew drop goal as Dawson goes through, makes a wonderful break. He's tackled 15 metres from the line, backs there. Wilkinson will drop for goal. There's offside surely against thing, and no Martin Johnson has it. He drives. There's 35 seconds to go. This is the one. It's coming back for Johnny Wilkinson. He drops for World Cup glory. Yes! It's up. It's over. He's done it. Johnny Wilkinson is England's hero yet again. And there's no time for Australia to come back. England have just won the World Cup. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, that was Rob Andrew, just lost for words uh, alongside the brilliant Ian Robertson commentary as England won the World Cup in 2003 against Australia uh, in Sydney and the man that threw the ball to Johnny Wilkinson and a big part of the Five Live team now, of course, is Matt Dawson. Hello, good evening. Hello, how are we all doing? Yes, really good, thank you. I will never tire of hearing that. and I'm guessing you will never tire of hearing that either. No, no. Uh, and do you know what? I've never heard that before. I've never heard the extended... You, I hear Robbo the whole time going for World Cup glory, but, yeah, just the goosebumps that shimmered across the whole of my body from this that sort of setup. And having been in that chair with, with Robbo, you know, you know when you're supposed to speak and Rob Andrews talking about the line and then Robbo's like chopped straight across it to say listen this is my job I am on it there was so much going on and yet everybody knew the focus was on the drop goal obviously Robbo knew where he was going with the drop goal but there was so much action going out so his his reaction to what he was seeing and then to still have enough of a crescendo to get to the World Cup. I don't think he I don't think he had any more octaves to go to, but it was an amazing bit of commentary. Yeah, and he absolutely knew what was happening, didn't he? I mean he he called every single moment of that perfectly and to be able to have that ability in that moment to, to know I mean you know, I mean you know, obviously Ian won won caps for Scotland. He was a very, very experienced rugby commentator and a player, but he absolutely knew what was going to happen there. As we all know, on this show, we know that radio makes sport much more exciting than it ever is. And when it is super, super exciting, it goes to a level that just can't be matched in any other kind of medium. But I I suppose it was the months and months and months of anticipation of the rugby and sort of English sporting community. They were expecting England to win. So there, there was just this constant... We were favourites. We were going to win every single game. We were going to go into the final. We were going to win it in normal time. Then we're going to win it in extra time. And then we've got the prodigal son of Johnny Wilkinson to hit a drop goal. It was, you say, the crescendo of of passion and noise was absolutely encapsulated in in Robbo's commentary. And, And still to this day, Ellie, when people talk about the World Cup and the World Cup final to me, they don't talk about the pictures. They talk about the commentary, mm. you know, and that's, the radio that speaks commentary. volumes. Yeah. So, so, Matt, is that really the first time you've heard, because you get the full plug there for that little dummy that sets up the bit of space and all that, all of the stuff, because you don't get that if you just hear the 10 seconds of Robbo. <laughs> Suddenly you're part, you're really part of the play now. You're not an inconsequential member of the team. You're not part of the team. You're, the, you're instrumental, mate. That's why you're so happy, because you've, you've, you've been suddenly catapulted back into history. Oh, you're a good man, Buncey. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> um, no, no, it was actually I was I was sort of referencing a little bit earlier. I was referencing from when there was that just that lovely conversation between Robert, who who really did have a a wonderful skill of bringing the people around him into the game. So, trying to compare to Rob's drop goal from '95 or just talking through the line out, what are people thinking? This is the moment. If you've ever practiced a line out, this has got to be the one. It's the most important line out in your life. And that was true. I mean, that's exactly what we were thinking. We all looked around and we we knew what we wanted to do, but we knew that there were 50 odd seconds left on the clock. This is it. And so to bring the audience in, for them to be closer to the radio or closer to you know the dashboard of the car, was exactly how we were as players. We know this is the moment. So it was as if they were in our minds, which makes it 
so much more special. And Matt, when when we talk about, as we are, these defining moments over the course of the 30 years of Five Live, to equate that to defining pieces of commentary. I've checked this with Ed Marriage, who is our rugby (laughs) union producer, and Ed's reminded me that Clive Woodward made Ian Robertson's commentary into part of his Christmas card that year. (laughs) And there was a button on the back of the card that when you pressed it, the commentary played. And on the front, it had a panoramic picture of the moment with the words, may all your Christmases be white. (laughs) I mean, you can't get any more defining than that, Matt. I've still got that somewhere. I'm fairly sure it wasn't even a button. It was was as you opened it. It was like a pop-up. So as you opened it, the commentary started. It was absolutely epic i mean yeah as, and i'll reiterate as far as comment do you imagine how many different commentaries around the world there would have been of that moment from all the different feeds from all, world feed to brazilian tv to german tv to all over the world and that that one is the commentary that people we remember across the world. It's, it's epic. I mean, my memory of that particular day, because I'd been sent down to Farnham Rugby Club, which was Johnny Wilkinson's first club. So obviously it was quite early in the morning, sort of breakfast time, so I had bacon sandwiches. And of course the clubhouse was packed with members of Johnny's family and people who'd known him since he was, he was a little lad in the juniors at Farnham. And at that moment, of course, when it, the drop goal went over... The big screen was completely obscured for me by people jumping up and down and getting in the way of the screen. So all I could hear was was Robbo's commentary. And I couldn't even hear that very well either because of of the noise. But then I just remember getting in my car afterwards. And then at the end of the programme, at the end of the broadcast, they replayed Robbo's commentary. And I just thought that is one of those great radio moments that we're going to be talking about in... 21 years' time, and we are. Doesn't that just epitomise it all, though, for, for, and for all of these great commentaries that we had? But what you just said there, Ellie, mm. you knew exactly where you were mm. Mm. when you heard that commentary. And, and there are some epic ones within this top 10. And for most of them, they are, li- they are parts of our lives. There are moments of our lives that we'll never, ever forget who we were with and where we were, and and it, it makes those special commentaries, you know, historic. That should be a prerequisite, really, shouldn't it? Absolutely. Speaking of Ian Robertson, though, the great Ian Robertson uh, commentated in 2003 on History for England, but he was also on the mic for two other rugby moments in our top 30. Now we know the ghosts of 1978 are being exercised at this very moment. J.P.R. Williams... Gerald Davis, JJ, Gareth Edwards, Phil Bennett. They were the men of the moment in the magic of 1978. But now there are new heroes out there on the pitch now as we go through the 80th minute. And the next time the whistle goes, it will be to signal the grand slam for Wales. In the ball goes, one by Ireland, out to Humphreys, Humphreys to Miller to Humphreys again, popped up to O'Driscoll, O'Driscoll goes hard gives it to Murphy, Murphy gets it inside, it's knocked on by Geffen Jones, the referee has seen it, he blows and the whistle, there it is Wales have won the Grand Slam and the whole of the Valleys from here to Swansea to Zanetli to every outpost of the Valleys of Wales they'll be singing non as Wales have done the Grand Slam. I now call on our president, Mr Mandela, to make the presentation of the William Webb Ellis Trophy to the captain, Francois Pinot. Both are wearing Springbok jerseys with number six on the back. One Francois Pinard gave to the president. Nelson Mandela is wearing that proudly today, proud of the new South Africa, as Francois Pinard holds the Webb Ellis Trophy aloft and Nelson Mandela waves his arms in the air. Well, that was uh, South Africa winning the World Cup in 1995 and before that, Wales winning the Grand Slam in 2005 in Cardiff, which I think was the loudest noise I have ever, ever heard, (laughs) tried to broadcast through uh, inside uh, the Millennium Stadium as it then was. I mean, Matt Dawson, you know, your your reflections on Ian Robertson, the great commentator, I mean, one of the Mm. great commentators that we've had in the last 30 years of Five Live and a man, as you say, that you had the, the privilege of sitting alongside on many occasions. 
Oh, I have carried his bags many, many times <laughs> around the world. Uh, and he won't mind me saying that. Just in- incredibly fortunate to not only have the rugby career I had, but Ian Robertson absolutely sponsored my position at the BBC when he knew that I was retiring. He knew that Rob Andrew was retiring from the comms and he, yeah, he was absolutely championing me to get that position. So I owe him a huge amount Downside to that, though, guys, is that I have heard every single story <laughs> multiple times uh, <laughs> to the point where I could I could easily ruin loads of his stories. You showed the Nelson Mandela clip and he tells this wonderful story, which I won't go with because it's far too long. It's an after dinner story, which ranges from about five to 50 minutes. But the crux of it is that he went to a Nelson Mandela press conference and needless to say, he didn't have an invitation to this uh, press conference. So just turned up expecting to be able to do an interview for the BBC with Nelson Mandela. And there was security everywhere. He went up to this enormous security guard and basically said to him, well, if you don't let me in, you are stopping over 100 million BBC worldwide listeners listening to Mr. Mandela and what he has to say right at this moment. And I think politically that would be the wrong. I tell you what, you go and tell Mr. Mandela that you've stopped (laughs) the BBC from... And and before you know it, he's through the door, he's right in the front, he's having a cup of tea with Nelson, you know, he's right in the thick of it. I mean, he's just the most magnificent... I'm I'm not going to... I'm not... I won't insult him by saying granddad. He's more... You know, he's just my... My my favourite uncle, my favourite big brother, what you want to say, he's just a wonderful wonderful man has a time for absolutely everybody he's brought everybody on his rugby journey yeah i'm i'm slightly biased but i think he he's the best and will be very very difficult to get anywhere near where he's been in sport where he's been in rugby and how he delivered rugby to the bbc it was just incredible well, fantastic words about an iconic broadcaster ian robertson now matt dawson lovely to have you on the program thanks ever so much what a joy Lovely to speak to you all. So we are very close to announcing the moment that you've chosen as the defining sporting moment of the last 30 years, narrowed down from a top 30. But it was a struggle to pick just 30, so here are some of the things that just narrowly missed out. Chris Hoy wins the gold for Great Britain. A gold medal hat-trick for the Scotsman. Laura Kenny almost with a smile on her face in the back straight. She leaves the rest of the field for dust. Five days after winning her first gold in the 400, Rebecca Addington has claimed another. But it's all gone good for Tony McCoy. He has the last one for Grand National. She's in! So some extraordinary names in that little montage, uh, John and Buncey, and, and they didn't even make the top 30. I know, I feel terrible, don't you, that they, that they weren't <laughs> How can in we it? leave Rebecca Adlington out of our top 30? Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you, when I looked at the, the list of 30 there, I came up with another 10 or 15 instantly, mm. and I don't, and I really don't envy the fact I didn't get a call and was uh, and was put on that panel. It would have, I would have been really not very happy. Any, anyway, we, cut we, anything. we didn't judge those ones. Oh, stop it, John. <laughs> you can't do it now. We've been on air about four and a half hours. You can't start saying that was nothing to do with me. No, no, don't start pointing at if Ellie. It, no. It had been up to me. No, no rubbish. I'm not having it. And I'm guessing that you're listening to this at home and thinking, how on earth did they leave? that out you know it's ridiculous but it's all subjective and, and it's all a bit of fun it's all a bit of think? fun it is so whatever you thought about our choices it is time to crown your winner more than 150,000 of you voted via the BBC Sport website and you chose this as your defining sporting moment of the 30 years that Five Live has been on air we're going to take you back to the 4th of August 2012 and London's Olympic Stadium Greg Rutherford now can he consolidate that lead? 
speed. It's way beyond eight metres. Is it beyond eight metres and 21 centimetres? All importantly, he gets the white flag. And now we once again await the measurement. And could we dream of three gold medals for Britain on this evening here with Jessica Ennis about to go in the last event of the heptathlon. Mo Farah in the men's 10,000 metres. Eight metres and 31 centimetres for Greg Rutherford. It's his second longest leap of the season, but most importantly, it extends his lead here. 8 metres and 21 centimetres, now out to 8.31, and he goes further clear and hangs on to the gold medal position with two rounds remaining. Hold on to everything you've got wherever you are on the road, at home, in your garden, because there could be two gold medals for Great Britain in the next 15, 20 minutes. Schwarzkopf of Germany is leading, but she's down the field overall, only in fifth position, and can't claw back enough points it's Ennis in second place and this 80,000 voice choir sing their praises now there's 200 metres to run Ennis is in third place she doesn't need to win but she's renewing her challenge here she wants to finish in style around in towards the home straight now and this is her chance to join the likes of Daly Thompson and Denise Lewis and Mary Peters on the list of Olympic champions in multi-events and she takes the lead And so a stadium roars and a nation roars as Ennis goes on to win the 800 metres and with it, Olympic gold! She raises both arms on a special, special night for Jessica Ennis and for British athletics. For three years, everybody's been saying, let's wrap her in cotton wool. And that is the reason why. And she drops onto her back, puts her hands on her face as she tries to take in the magnitude of what she's achieved. She is the Olympic champion. Here it is, Steve. Will Clay is the man, the only man who can deny Rutherford. So Will Clay, the American, the world indoor champion in the triple jump, sets out in this long jump final. He's fast on the approach. It looks good on the ball, but he forward rotates. His feet are down. And that confirms that Britain's Greg Rutherford is the Olympic champion. The best part is he's trying to look cool now. <laughs> but brilliant. Olympic champion. Oh, my word. I mean, he, t- he took the competition by the scruff of the neck. Eight metres and 31 in the fourth round. His kit's off. He's ready to jump. This is like Jess Ennis' 800, isn't it? He can jump. He can do what he wants. He, he can do a forward roll through He should the pit. run through the pit and yeah. just go on a lap <laughs> yeah. of honour. That's yeah. what he should do. <laughs> but he could also win in style with a British record and the best leap in the world this year and one of the best at the Olympic Games in recent years. And now he waves both arms together above his head and gets the crowd on that far side of the stadium clapping in unison as they complete the first four laps in the men's 10,000 metres with Mo Farah in the leading group. But the whole field of 29 has bunched up now as just ahead of them, Greg Rutherford sets off then for his sixth and final attempt. He hits the takeoff board, but the pressure was off and so too the motivation had died. And he stands still and lifts his arms and says, come on, that's worth some applause and surely it is. Greg Rutherford wins Britain's first gold medal in the long jump, their first medal of any colour for nearly 50 years. And now he can stand alongside the likes of Lynn Davis as Britain's field gold medalist at the Olympic Games. And he's going to cry. Look at him. He's trying to take it all in. And I'm sure we will all stand and salute him because there is no nicer guy on the team. Now with one lap to go, Farah hits the front. He starts his run for home with 400 metres to go. And now he's being rifted by the crowd. And into second place goes Muchiri. Bekele is also trying to make a challenge. Galen Ruff is in fourth place. There's no more than a metre or so between the first three. And Farah now is still in front. Can he gradually wind up the pace? 200 metres to go. He needs a blistering last half a lap. Taraku Bekele coming through into second place. Kenanisa Bekele is in fifth place, but he looks like a spent force. Around on the crown of the bend, in towards the home straight. And Farah is still in front. He's being challenged by Taraku Bekele. He looks over his shoulder. He's being carried on this wave of emotion. Farah hits the front. Farah wins goal for Britain in the men's 10,000 metres and immediately turns to celebrate. What a night! Three gold medals for Great Britain for Jessica Ennis, for Greg Rutherford 
And now for Mo Farah in the men's 10,000 metres, the first British athlete ever to win Olympic gold at this distance. And now he falls to the track once again. Cannot believe the magnitude of what he's achieved here. Mo Farah is the Olympic champion. Well, let's bring in Mike Costello and Alison Kerbishley, who were both there that night alongside Mark Pugach, Steve Backley and Darren Campbell, who you just heard in that mix. And, and Mike, you are sitting alongside us in the studio with just a little hint of a smile on your face. Yeah, that brings everything back. I mean, 12 years on, I've, I've come here today actually from um, filming over in East London and I came through Stratford Station where most fans came through on trains, tubes, buses back then and still I get the same kind of tingle, same kind of buzz when I walk through there and all the signs still to this day saying Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park. So, mm. um, yeah, 12 years on, it's it's really special. Yeah. Still. And Ali, what about what about your memories of that day as well? Did you do you sit there thinking this is going to be a night of nights? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, obviously, we were second day into the athletics, and the writing was very much on the wall with with Jess Ennis. She was the face of the games, as we know, and she she held that mantle so well, and she did not put a foot wrong um, from a British record in the first event all the way through personal best in the javelin. And I think once she'd done the javelin earlier on in the morning session and she knew she only had the 800 to, to go, I guess then all the talk was then, hang on a minute, you know, we've now started to look at the schedule and we realised that only, what, 40-odd minutes after she was going to cross the line in the 800, we had Mo going in the 10,000 as one of the absolute favourites. And I think, yeah, you know, everyone goes on about Greg being this surprise, but... Yes, he'd never got onto a, an international podium or global podium before then, but he was still one of the best in the world lining up in that field. And I think that's where you then look at the, the magic of the stadium that night. You know, I can't believe there was actually only 80,000 in there because listening back, it sounds like there was about 280,000. You know, and Mike, Mike talks about Stratford. And I think for me, it was, it was leaving the stadium that night that was just as special because it was almost like nobody wanted to leave. We all wanted to stay there and we all wanted to talk about it with everyone that you bumped into. Uh, it really was just something that, yeah, we'll never have that that sort of atmosphere, that kind of performance again, but it was so special to be there, yeah. I mean, so this is the number one defining moment of Five Lives history. And, and the thing was that it's, it's quite difficult to say it was a moment because it was a succession of moments, but it all came together into one beautiful night, I suppose, Mike, didn't it? Yeah, it did. And I think listening back to the commentary there, there was there was still this, this feeling of uncertainty around Mo Farah in particular. By the time we got to the evening session, Jessica Ennis had already thrown really well in the javelin to, to basically preserve her lead. And in boxing parlance, she only had to stand up to win. Mm. With Greg Rutherford, as Alison was saying, he didn't have the same kind of championship form that Ennis and, and Mo Farah did. And you might have noticed there, I, I did, um, the kind of urgency in, in the final lap with Mo Farah was, was centred on the previous year at the World Championships. He'd been overtaken on the final lap. And so there was kind of this dread that it would happen all over again on this amazing night for, for British sports. So um, there were so many elements in, in, into that one, as you say, moment um, across the night. A couple of things. First of all, Mike, give us, give, because I know you, you keep great detail. I've got some details here, timings. Is it, was it 44 minutes from one to the one, two, three goals? Was it 44 minutes official? Is that, is that the time? And secondly, there was something that Ali missed out there. There was actually an Olympic pass ticket, Olympic park ticket. So there were thousands and thousands, <laughs> including my kids, were inside the Olympic park. So in addition to the 80,000 in the stadium, there were, I mean, it seemed to me hundreds of thousands. Every single part of that Olympic Park, which is still open now to the public, was full, and you had to have a ticket to get in. So on the big screens, there was chaos. But it, was it 44 minutes? I, I mean, I'm still intrigued by that. From from the moment that we knew that that Jess Ennis had crossed the line, and then at that stage, we still had to wait until the surety that that Greg Rutherford had won the long jump. So it was it was 40. I mean, seconds either way, but it was either 44 or 45 wow. minutes. But we we all of us talk 
about the, the the tiny margins in sport. You know, in in, in our other games, Steve, the, the the punch that misses the chin by just a, a narrow margin, the penalty, John, that you know hits the underside of the bar and bounces out rather than bounces in. Mo Farah ran a week later in the five thousand meters. So his Olympic Games take away the five thousand meters heat. The two finals, ten thousand meters and five thousand meters, a total of thirty seven and a half laps. His total winning margin was 0.8 of a second. Wow. <laughs> so if you blink, everyone here blink, that's that's the total winning margin in terms of time over all of that distance. That's the chance he took and 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 that was the risk he had. Virtually no 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 chance at all to get anything wrong, even a single stride wrong. We talk about wow. the 100 meters and 41 strides from start to finish and you can't get one of those wrong. But it's you know it's it's just as competitive. There were twenty nine athletes in that ten thousand meters, and at least a dozen of them could have, could have won that yeah. race. And John, while all of this was happening, you were actually over on Sports Extra. What were you doing there? Yeah, not quite so memorable. <laughs> as I watched, <laughs> as I watched yet another team of men's footballers lose a penalty <laughs> shootout <laughs> in Cardiff. We were on Sports Extra. It felt like we were down the end of a, a very quiet road. You were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But what I, what I would also add to that, you know, this has been voted. Why is this being mm. voted as the defining mm. moment? And I think it's because it's more than just what it was on the night. I think people will have voted for it because of how they remember it made them feel. Mm. And that night was right at the heart of that Olympics in London. And I know that so many people will say, well, it cost this, it cost that. I think that's the thing you can't put a value on. It feels it feels like halcyon days now, doesn't it, to think about that summer of 2012. Talking about the atmosphere in the stadium, Mike, we heard you uh, earlier on commentating on David Weir in the Paralympics as well. You think about all the great Paralympians that we've seen and, and Tanny Gray Thompson in this era, in this 30 years as well, who, who you'd have seen and commentated on too. But it was such a game-changing year that year and such a game-changing few weeks across the Olympics and the Paralympics. It was. And I remember talking to a couple of news journalists who'd gone into the Games and they were quite open about it, basically to smash the Games to pieces, to get as many negative stories. We all know who, who, who these people are out there, to get as many negative stories as they could. After three or four days, the best that they could come up with was that in, in certain arenas, uh, there were members of the military that were called in to fill some seats. That was about as, as, mm. as heavy as it got in terms of the negativity. By the time we got to Super Saturday, even the hardest of those hard-nosed hacks had given up because the mood around London, the mood around the country had changed. And we're getting it now ahead of Paris a lot of Parisians, when they're polled, will tell you that they don't want the Games. Mm. The same was happening in London. I remember being told that more people left Sydney than actually came in for the Games in 2000. And yet by the time we got to Super Saturday and that amazing atmosphere, and our, Sebastian Coe told me that after Super Saturday, the ticket surge for sales of the events at the Paralympics wow. absolutely mushroomed because people just everywhere around the country and even even extended to in different parts of the world wanted to be in the stadium where Super Saturday happened. Mm. Even if it meant being there for the Paralympics or for later events at the Olympics, they just wanted to say they'd been in the stadium where Super Saturday happened. And, and quite a lot of people have asked me over the last week or so about, you know, my memories of 30 years of Five Life having been there since the very beginning. And, and it all, always comes back to the Olympic Games because, you know, in that time, um, I was lucky enough to be, well, Atlanta, Sydney, Athens, uh, Beijing, London, uh, Rio, and then not in Tokyo, but covering that from from back here because of, of COVID. But the, the ones that I always pick out as my favourites were Sydney and London, and, and I think hopefully Paris will be the same because of that fan engagement, you know, and, and Buncey, you know, you've, you've done exactly the same summer games as me. And actually, you want to feel that buzz, those, those I like your kids coming into the Olympic Park just to experience the Olympics. And I remember my kids as well, because obviously when we got the games for London, thinking my kids are going to be perfect age, they'll be 12 and 11 in 2012. And to be able to take them to the Olympic Park and say, this is why 
mum and dad disappear off every four years to go to the Olympic Games. This is what it's all about. It's not just kids. I worked in 2012, which is about my sort of fifth Olympics or whatever, with, with Darren Fletcher. And it was Fletcher's first Olympics. So every morning I'd say to him, come on, Fletch, what we'll do is we'll go and see this. And he'd say, no, the boxing doesn't start to do it. So forget that, son. Go and watch we, handball. We can go and watch handball. We can go and watch, we can watch Usain Bolt. He's running at 1pm. We can still get to the boxing on time. I took him to see Kobe Bryant. He's since then become a basketball expert. It's an absolute <laughs> truth. I'm claiming that, baby. So I had Fletch, a grown man, was with me like a wild-eyed kid walking around the Olympic Park, watching the cycling, watching the hockey. What took Fletch to water polo? I loved every second of it. And he was a grown man, so it's not just kids, Elliot, right? It's a, yeah. There's a little bit of sporting child in all of us, and I found it in Fletcher at that Olympics. And I mean, I remember the opening ceremony. I was commentating on the opening ceremony when we there was still that negativity. What's it mm. going to be like? How are we going to cock it up? <laughs> and I remember going to the rehearsal where you were sworn to secrecy and seeing it, the Danny Boyle show, as it was, and and my good feeling was that this was a real triumph and that this was going to really be a springboard for what would follow. And a little like you, Ali, I always think when everyone says, what are the great things, what are the best things you've experienced working here, uh, being... A commentator on that was was right up there for me. And, and Hallie, what do you think about the pressure on the, our home athletes as well? You know, so so I mean, when it came to the Paralympics, Ellie Simmons was was there, David Weir, but Jess particularly, Jessica Ennis Hill was was the face of the games, and for her to win that gold medal with with the grace that she did, there was so much pressure on her. Yeah, there was a huge amount of pressure. And when you rewind that back to the, the previous Olympics before, she wasn't there. She had to pull out through injury. So this was her first Olympics. You know, yes, she'd been a world champion prior to that, but she'd had her disappointments and ups and downs. But like you said, she was 100% the face of the Olympics. Her face was on a huge field as you were landing into Heathrow saying, welcome to our patch or whatever it said, welcome to our backyard. And we talked to her, uh, Catherine Mary and I, about how she looks back on that pressure. And she said it was all down to the group around her, the family, her friends, her coach. Everyone kept her feet on the ground and they didn't protect her from it. They sort of almost took the mick out of her for it and, and sort of joked with it because you couldn't hide from it. She just found a way in the same way that Kathy Freeman did. You know, Mike's right, once kind of she delivered, we could almost start to get excited about Greg and uh, and Mo later on in the evening. And I find it amazing. You know, we're not even talking about Usain Bolt and this came in his era. He wasn't the man that night. You know, the, the 100 finals still had to happen the following night. And I remember sitting next to Mike getting ready for that third night of athletics and the two of us were just drained <laughs> it's like you're now gonna have to call the blue ribbon event mike you know the day after something that we're never ever going to see again and you know how do you muster the energy because uh you know we poured everything into that that august the fourth night and that 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 was in the evening before that we had to get up in the morning for the women's marathon <laughs> and it's just, that's the, the kind of endless cycle. Mm. And you just have to keep switching on and switching on. And, and and I think most of us are so, to talk about, Steve, you talked about, you know, the, the kids. We're all still big kids. And I've often said mm. one of the keys to, to like longevity in commentary is never grow up. Mm. That's what keeps you going, as Alison was saying. Once, once you sit down, yes, you might be drained in that sort of half an hour before, but, you know, the red light goes on and... Yeah. Off you go. As Steve's already established on the programme, though, commentating on Usain Bolt is a piece of cake. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Ali, thank you so much. Thank you to Mike Costello as well. Buncey and John, before we before we finish, happy with Super Saturday as your number one? I think so. I had a feeling that it might go that way. I think we could come back tomorrow and do it again and we might have a different number one. Then we could come back the next day and do it again and we might have a different number one. That expression is just sport for choice. I mean, really just are. the memories today, just some of the, some of those voices and some of that emotion, some of that raw emotion and just some of the memories being flooded back. I wasn't at all 30 of the events. I was at a couple of them. That seems enough for me. But it's been great just wallowing in it as I suspected it would be and you know, it's the power of live radio sports commentary and i would say to anyone encourage your son daughter mm -hmm. nephew niece to start listening to live sport on the radio you will not regret it and that's what i would say yeah 
We've all had long careers covering live sport and it's just the best job in the world. And thank you so much for being part of the show tonight, uh, John and Steve. Thank you uh, for listening as well. Five Live, 30 years old, a good time to listen to some great moments. But of course, we're not going anywhere. Plenty more to come over the next few weeks. The climax of the Premier League and the Champions League here on Five Live. Then we'll be off to Germany for the Euros and then Paris takes centre stage for the Olympics and the Paralympics, plus the Grand National, Wimbledon, the Open and a Test Match Summer as well. Five Live has been and always will be your home of live sport. If you missed any of the show, then you can listen back to the whole thing via BBC Sounds. Thank you so much for listening. Gordon Smart is next after the BBC News.